OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. A little bit later on today, we're going to be pulling out some pictures of the scene, the, the horrible scene that we discovered when we arrived into work this morning. It was uh, Neil Tracy and Owen Sheehan sitting there with a corona of cans and food wrappers from Saturday night, and they hadn't moved. They were just sitting there with nothing but booze and you know the way that the cigarette ash is kind of on the top of the can but a little bit off to the side of it because they've missed it they've been they've been awake the whole time screaming in each other's face johan van grand red and white army johan van grand's red and white army johan and except so owen is this morning a little bit too croaky to be able to present properly so it, i'm flying solo between now and uh 10 o'clock this morning isn't that correct it's actually a disgusting sight out there be honest I'm not proud of, of our celebrations on Saturday night but sometimes you just got to indulge in your disgustingness what's rare is wonderful Owen like I mean this is it this is it it's like Munster have taken a shovel to uh, the Leinster depth chart over the years and it's like oh that's a very good team and that team is better than Munster now let's dig down a little bit with the shovel and that's not such a good team but it's still a good team and that's still better than Munster and they finally got to that point where they started to hear tin with the, the shovel on Saturday night where they had reached the bottom of the Leinster depth. And now they realise how bad the Leinster team needs to be from a starting lineup perspective for Munster to actually beat them. James Ryan was in the team. Yeah. James Lowe was in the team. Yeah. Uh, Gary Ringrose was in the team. It was yeah. a good team. It was a good team. Andrew Porter was in the team. It, it, was, it was a good team. And Munster have been playing well recently. But still, you can't really say this is a, a, a seismic moment in the, the shape of this rivalry it can be a big moment individually for Munster maybe because all of a sudden it's not seven w losses on the bounce against Leinster it, it, that that has been statistically ended and it will be interesting to see what that does going into next season there are there are a number of ways you can paint this and uh, the, the glass I would definitely say is is definitely 50 percent full and uh, you can either say that that's half empty or half full, depending on your outlook on it. OK, and you are saying half full, obviously. I can hear the, the excitement in your voice. The DLN day break for the try that, you know, I mean, that was like, that, that looked genuinely world class, was uh, how I saw it described. Tree Red Kings was very happy to see that. And, you know, I, you know you've got you to take these victories on, you know? You punched, you punched up, you landed a knockout punch. Come on. It's like, story of the weekend is that, Munster got, and such an important tro tournament as well. It's really, it's great that, you know, that first Rainbow Cup, uh, half of it will be nestling on the, on the do, do they split it in half at the end of the competition it, and they give one to, one half to Transvaal and the other to Munster? No, you, Munster just get the trophy without Indigo and Violet, but everything else is included in it. And uh, like they'll, they'll take that. A trophy's a trophy. You can't see that anyway. You can't do it. You can do a trouble in a, tr a trouble a treble in rugby uh, nowadays, and uh, Leinster certainly won't be a treble winner. So great team, I think not. You need special Neil glasses to be able to see the uh, the other side of it. All, all joking aside, though, a victory is. I mean, you're not. I mean, you're not biting any of this. You don't think that it's important or good in the long term. You think it's. Well, you can't. You can't all of a sudden start caring about the Rainbow Cup just because Munster won. No, you can't. No, like, that's no, the whole point no, of being no. a sports fan. Is like, ah, ah, nobody ah. get nobody gave a damn about this thing before Saturday, and then all of a sudden Munster won. It's like, oh, this is a, a big thing immediately, and it's not. It's not a big thing. Beating Leinster, yeah, that, that could be a big deal from Munster's perspective. But like, I would definitely say that you can't get too carried away about a victory unless the team that you're playing really care about the defeat. And like, I mean, like this weekend is all that matters for Leinster. Like, the, to get carried away would be ridiculous, and nobody in... I'd be, I'd be shocked if anybody in Munster was getting carried away with, with the win. Now, the thing was, it was, it was a pretty significant win. The, the scoreline was pretty nice. It, it wasn't like a grinding out and almost getting embarrassed by a second-string Leinster team. There, there was none of that, really. Munster were really impressive. And there were signs, as I say, like that performance against Toulouse the week after the Pro 14 final was really good. Damien de Allende had, had started to show why exactly he's a World Cup winner. He was brilliant in that game against Toulouse. Joey Carberry is finally starting to, to get back to himself. Yeah. And like it helps when your pack is going better and that's where they lost the game against Leinster, what is it, a month ago at this stage. I, and the other thing is that almost everybody is, is fit at the moment. So it's the first time in a long time that you can say that the vast majority of the players you would want to be playing are playing. There's definitely some, some injuries they have and there's some depth problems. But on, as, a, as a whole, this is about as fit as it ever been. Unfortunately, it's really unfortunate that this Rainbow Cup exists now because if it didn't the Pro 14 would just be coming to its logical conclusion and all of a sudden you'd be like well 
the Leinster Munster final this time is going to be as close as we thought it was going to be when they did play for a trophy and it was meaningless in the end. The other thing that's interesting this week is that um, the Premier League and the Carabao Cup final, while, OK, if you're a City fan, you're pretty happy with how that worked out and if you're, you know, like to make the Spursy memes, then you're pretty happy with how that worked out as well because they were, it was the ultimate Spursy performance from a, a team managed by a 29-year-old. But uh, the football over the course of the weekend, not very good, not particularly interesting... Not amazing, unless you're a Burnley fan, perhaps. That's like the one day of the year where you get to see what it would be like to support one of the good teams. And for everybody else, it was kind of a bit meh. Mm. And riding over the horizon are four of Europe's super clubs to give us two games to really look forward to and whet the appetite this week. Wouldn't it be great if it could be like this all the time, On <laughs> Wouldn't it be great? Well, like, I mean, the counter-argument to that straight away is that more football is not necessarily good. Like, we've been given an absolute feast of it all season long. This season, I don't care what anybody says, has gone on for three years. That, that, that is what has happened. There have definitely been about 1,500 games that have been televised live in this season's Premier League, and it feels like I've watched 90% of them. They've got progressively worse as the season has gone on, it feels. They probably haven't, but it certainly feels that they've got more boring and that they've become more elongated affairs and the players have just become more exhausted. Somebody said 12 goals over the whole weekend. I mean, do you remember the first weekend with 12 goals in every game? Yeah. And it was like, wow, this is going to be an incredible season. And particularly at the end of the year, the defences get tired. It'll be loads of goals. Mm. But actually what's happened is that the strikers have got tired and they just can't score. If Burnley hadn't scored four uh, against Wolves, it could have been one of the lowest scoring weekends in a very long time. It would have borne comparison with, with any uh, weekend in history. However, uh, obviously it finished off that cracking game last night between Villa and West Brom. I know you were all watching that. Uh, but notwithstanding, nothing happened in the football that was of, of any significance <laughs> apart from uh, well, Liverpool crapping out. We'll talk about this a little bit later on with, with um, David Myler and, and the row between uh, Harry Maguire and Fred, following on the row between Harry Maguire and Rashford. But uh, I, I, you know, I, I do genuinely think everybody this week is going to be looking at Real Madrid and Chelsea and Paris Saint-Germain against Manchester City on Wednesday evening going, European football is brilliant. Mm. Yeah, and isn't it great that after the week where people said that football was saved, that uh, Manchester City managed to win the, their fourth consecutive Carabao Cup and give it the big the big one, the, the, the big four. And uh, those are scenes that we as sports fans will never forget, is uh, Manchester City winning their fourth Carabao Cup. Like The point of this weekend being really good is that people want that, but in sparing doses. I, I think we know what is too much football at this point. This season has shown us exactly what is too much football, and we have reached that peak comprehensively this season. If anything, you should be pairing it back if you want to maintain the quality. The Champions League is perfect. We know that this week is going to be good because it's going to be one half of 180 minutes of football, more than likely, that we get from these ties. Yeah, the, the first legs, I, I, I don't know, the first legs sometimes not as good as the second legs and um, because obviously the, the knockout is about to happen. But uh, at the same time, I think everybody's genuinely excited about these, maybe less so about the... Real Madrid, Chelsea won because Chelsea can definitely bore their way through that over the, the two legs. All of a sudden, they've found their defensive mojo. Uh, but the second uh, semi-final, it should be spectacular. Just very briefly, uh, Maguire blasted idiot Fred as the back page headline on the London Times. Uh, Leeds United uh, game at the weekend. Harry Maguire so frustrated with his teammate Fred's performance, he called him an effing idiot. This follows on from, obviously, Marcus Rashford during the nil-all draw away to Crystal Palace last month when um, Rashford called Maguire an effing knobhead. I'm like, this is, gra this is the good part about there being no fans. We get to hear exactly what's said on the field. They obviously are at it the whole time. <laughs> like, they, uh, obviously, this is what uh, Harry Maguire knows, that, uh, that tough love is good love when it comes to Manchester United. And it, it's interesting when you see United players celebrating a goal and all the team gather around. If Harry Maguire happens to be in that huddle, his is the voice you tend to hear. He's good at projecting his voice, Harry Maguire. He's good at shouting. And clearly this is something that they've been instructed to embrace in the Manchester United camp. I don't think it's any bad thing. I think that as long as it doesn't actually spill over to any feud in the dressing room, which it doesn't seem to have done, then away you go, Harry. Keep, keep roaring at your teammates. And maybe that'll deflect from, from any deficiencies in your own game as well. Do you think we could go around the office using this terminology to each other. I mean, whenever yeah. everybody's back in the office. But uh, Irish people aren't great at taking slights. I, I think... Uh, We'd bear grudges a bit more, wouldn't we? Yeah, but Irish people are much more sly. They wouldn't say effing knobhead straight out. No, it would be to your back. 
it, correct. Whereas, like, if you say it to my face and I'm happy out. Right. The, we, we're beside the kitchen, so you can kind of, you can go into the kitchen and pretend that nobody can hear it, but actually you can hear everything in the kitchen. So it was like, that she ends an effing knobhead. Would that, and then you would hear it, but third hand, and then you wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Yeah. The or or would, I, would you? That would be, I must try this out. Yeah, like I'd probably just resort to like a Facebook status saying, you think you know someone, and then uh, they call you an effing knobhead in the kitchen. <laughs> it's uh, 7.40 this morning. If anybody wants to get in touch with us, uh, you can get us on 0879-180-180. OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. The other big story from the weekend, of course, is that Rangers managed to lose a competition in which they were the only team left. They went out on penalties to St. Johnson after a 4-2 um, penalty defeat. Uh, oh, right, okay. This is incredible drama. The goalkeeper scored the equaliser. Yeah. I didn't see that. Goalkeeper scores the equaliser. Rangers uh, knocked out. What were they going for the quintuple or something like that? And, um, yeah, it all, it all ends in tears for Rangers yesterday. Like, I mean, uh, uh, it, there was never a moment when you think, this is a good idea that the goalkeeper coming up will actually uh, result in something. This was a thing we used to see in the 1990s. The goalkeeper scoring is not something we see anymore because set pieces are so well organised and having an extra body in there will actually disrupt your ability to score a goal. Not the case for St. Johnson yesterday. They clearly practised this and uh, they managed to, to score a late equaliser against Rangers and end up getting the job done in the end. Xander Clark is the name of the goalkeeper, the uh, most Scottish name that you could potentially have. And uh, he's got a giant flowing uh, Nordic beard and uh, red locks. And there you go. Um, so look, uh, they went, I can't, I can't believe this. I just assumed this is one of those things where if you are the best team, if you are, if Rangers or Celtic is so, so dominant, then you just have to win all the competitions because otherwise, what's the point of the season? Well, absolutely. Uh, and uh, Xander was a hero before that as well. I think he had a couple of good saves. And then after that as well, the game goes to a penalty shootout and he makes two saves in the shootout. So he really is the hero of the weekend, Xander Clark and uh, St. Johnson. What a moment for them. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we, we obviously are quite looking forward to the return of uh, Gaelic Games action. Some brilliant Gaelic Games stuff over the course of the weekend, uh, particularly on our channels. Really interesting interview with Kevin McStay, which you should subscribe to our GAA feed to get. He talked about losing the one-man race to become the Mayo manager um, and really how that whole process unfolded. He gets into some detail and is a bit reticent about other parts of the detail. I think you can fill in the blanks yourself. He talks about... Uh, members of the, the ruling committee and the decision making the Keystone Cops was one of the uh, the phrases that was used and it, it's really brilliant stuff with Joe from yesterday afternoon's show uh, it's about an hour long he talks about everything else as well the return to play and his own playing days as well and we've just put up that five minute clip as a, a little taster of, of what the rest of it was like but unbelievably strong stuff about the the Muppetry at at county board level and when you just think that like there are so many of the county boards around the country who are trying to build a system to allow the best players in that county go up against Dublin you see that the game is it's kind of a bit rigged against so many of the best players in the country and uh, it will give you a great pause when it comes to previewing stuff when you think well there's a couple of very well run organizations and the rest of them are striving, and some of them are not even striving because there's, uh, there's little fiefdoms. And, um, it was brilliant insight, I thought, to uh, where we are at the moment with so many of those county boards and the issues that are arising. Yeah, like, I mean, th this is something that would definitely frustrate you if you're supporting a county that is supposed to do better than they are, for example, a, a county that may have not won in all Ireland in 50, 60 years, and you feel like you have the players to do so. You would like to think that those players have been given every single opportunity, which is with a, with a well-run county board. Now, the thing is, Dublin have just got their house in order so spectacularly at this point that everybody will feel like that they're uh, lagging behind them a little bit. But there are so many situations where counties end up shooting themselves in the foot anyway. Yeah, you, you obviously had a relatively interesting trip to Mayo County Board. How long ago was that now? I mean, it was obviously pre-pandemic. Was it long pre-pandemic? There's like uh, AC... Uh, or BCAD, it's like uh, before the pandemic, it's all the same now, and then we're in the pandemic, and then there's going to be a time after this where it's like, oh, we start again. So how long ago was that? It was it was BC, obviously. I, I actually can't remember. It must have been 2019, maybe, like, or was it 2020? When did the pandemic, what year is this? This is 2021. 
So may maybe early 2020, I actually just can't remember. That feels like a hell of a long time ago. Like I, well, actually, are we like a year on? The, one of the last GEA stories I remember before, uh, <laughs> before uh, the pandemic was the, uh, obviously the, the Abramovich of Mayo GEA tweeting uh, Horn out, enough is enough. Uh, and then uh, deleting uh, his Twitter account as well as uh, Twitter, and then that was the the breaking of the relationship between him and and Mayo G. Yeah, that was one of the last stories we had before the pandemic. And Tim O'Leary. Tim O'Leary. And pe people think that you know we didn't miss G. A. It's stories like that that we've missed over the past. Like we're watching Leeds versus Manchester United when in an alternate universe there could be a millionaire involved in awfully GEA right now who could be getting disbanded and disowned by his own county men because of a tweet he put up. These are the sorts of things we're missing and we just don't know about it. We do. We, we absolutely miss everything. The other thing, thing that happened over the course of the weekend or is happening today is that uh, tennis and golf is reopening. Um, one of our colleagues has taken the week off. <laughs> oh, well, this is going to be interesting. Is it an on-air colleague? No, no. JP. Uh, hey, 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 let's not name names here. <laughs> I mean, come on. A good journalist never reveals his sources. It's like good man Owen. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's just coincidental that the, the uh, golf courses are reopened and um, there's like been a, a little bit of a lack. I would say this is happening in a lot of different workplaces. Uh, all of a sudden it's like, I'm working from home today. I'll, yeah. I'll be on the phone, won't have access to... Oh, the internet's down. I'm on 3G, so don't send me any documents. Just happy to take calls, so long as you don't hear the sound of whoosh in the background. Um, and look, fair play to everybody for doing the stuff that they do, and fair play to everybody for going out over the weekend. If you've got good weekend stories that you'd like to share with us, 087-9180-180 is the WhatsApp number if you want to get in touch with us. And, um, yeah, okay, so... I'll tell you what's coming up on the show between uh, now and 10 o'clock this morning. We've got David Myler standing by. We're going to talk to him right now. Run you through the sports pages. Uh, Stacey Flood, fresh from Ireland, finishing as the best of the rest in the Six Nations at the weekend as uh, they put Italy to the sword in the final Six Nations game. Alan Quinlan going to join us at 8.45. The performance rankings at five past nine. Give us your um, entries for the performance rankings. You uh, could win a Gillette shaving kit and the uh, OTB reaction continues at half nine. But uh, it is 7.48 this morning and David Myler is with us. David, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. We were, uh, we were just chatting before you came on there about um, a little bit of verbals on the pitch with your teammates. This is um, Harry Maguire calling Fred an effing idiot on the back of being called an effing knobhead by his own teammate, Marcus Rashford, last month. And uh, what goes? How, how much can you get away with and go, oh, look, sorry, just in the heat of the moment? Um, I Look, you can. it happens every day in training, happens every game. Um, we'll have been, probably Fred's made a mistake, and then obviously, you know, United are pushing desperately to try and win the game, so Harry said something to him. Happens all the time. I think it happens in every walk of life, every form of sport. Um, I think it happens all the time. Do you get forgiven, like it, it, do you get forgiven straight away? Like, or is there, do you bear a grudge at any point uh, with any of your teammates? I think like some people will hold grudges. I definitely do think it's how, say for argument's sake, once Harry goes back into the change room after, if Harry was to have another go at Fred or continue to be shouting at him, then that's kind of like where grudges are almost formed. You know, that you're kind of, Fred, obviously, if you're Brazilian, would kind of turn to other lads, be like, have you heard this fella? He's non-stop. Like, you know, and they kind of like, but oh, I think, you know, it, it, people read a lot into it. It was a bit like, you know, Marcus Rashford and the Harry one, as you said, tell him, you know, whatever he said. People do read a lot into it. It does happen all the time. It's just the heat of emotion. Every player's there and they're desperate to win. I do, but I certainly do feel like even we're here now talking about it. You know, that it's like, it does happen. Of course, in sport, it's common. Fellas are, you know, always shouting and roaring at one another. Um, but that's just emotions. You know, they're there and they're desperate to win. That's their job for Manchester United. And sometimes tempers do boil over. Just for the record, I don't think it's a big deal at all, but I'm really interested in, like, how much you can get away with. And certain players, I presume, have reputations that they're just a bit mouthy and it doesn't mean anything. But then I presume there are other players who, if they do call you something... Uh, you're like, what? Hang on a second. What you? Because you didn't. You well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say Harry's mouthy. Um, from my time playing with him, he was never one to be shouting and roaring. At, like obviously, every now and then he'd have a moan. But everyone, that's normal. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't strike Harry as the one. Course, look. In the few years since I played with him, you know, he's done really well at Leicester. And then he's gone. And he's captain Manchester United. 
Um, so he's obviously developed his character. Oh, obviously, he's captain. Um, but he was never one to be grabbing lads or screaming, roaring. Um, you know, it's it's these fellas are here and they're desperate to win. Emotions do take over. Some of the worst ones are like in the five sides in training. That's like really hot. And like, obviously, you're playing against your teammates. Do you know what I mean? So there's there's great rivalry in those games. Like we used to always play um, young v old on a Friday, and like the young lads used to take a proper serious, like because you wanted to beat the older, experienced ones, and that got heated. Things were said, tackles flew in. Um, some of those games were like proper fascinating. Where, like I said, tempers do boil over, um, which is good though. I think it, it. Look, you can you can have certain players who who don't like it, and like you said, they hold a grudge. And then they start looking at teammates differently. Others revel in it and they, like it inspires them and it drives them on to do better. What's the worst thing a teammate's ever said to you on the pitch? Do you know what? I don't know what the, the, the worst a teammate has said to me. Um, I do remember years ago when I played against Manchester City with Sunderland. I'll never, I'll never forget it. Just because it's, it's one of those standout things that I couldn't believe someone said it to me. But um, I've been involved in kind of a, a tackling with Gareth Barry, and we've, we've had him coming together. He said some verbal to me, I said some verbal back to him. And then I was thinking, like, in that split second, that kind of pause, you have someone who's played X amount of games in the Premier League, a million won trophies. Yeah. yeah, he's done so much. And he just went, You're ugly. <laughs> and I just, I remember turning to him, kind of going, Is that it? Is that the best you can give me? <laughs> I just laughed. I was like, I want, I was like, I was expecting him even, even to bring up like say money, like his appearances. I don't like, I don't think Gareth Barry's that type of, you know, I don't know him, but at that age, you're kind of thinking like you could bring up your appearances, your money, your medals, everything. He just went, you're ugly. And I was like, oh, my God. I was, that's thrown off my head. Um, <laughs> in regards to the teammate, um, Ooh. I suppose I've been called stupid a couple of times. <laughs> um, I, I I do remember a funny one when I was at Hull. We were obviously going for promotion the first year I was there in 12, 13. And we had played, we had played Barnsley away. And if we'd won the game, we were promoted. We ended up losing 2 0. We took like 5,000 fans away to Oakwell and all that. And all this big hype and we lost. And, we were leading to the Cardiff game, which is the final game of the season, knowing if we won, we got promoted. So training was like at a high level of intensity. I remember I was demanding the ball off Abdullah Fay. If you remember him, he was a centre half. He played with Stoke and Newcastle and whatever. And in the middle of the session, he just stopped and he put his foot in the ball and he picked the ball up into his hands. He just said, you need to calm down. You are running around like a crazy lunatic. Um, that was quite interesting. <laughs> but I've had... I've had all sorts. I imagine I've dished out some as well. Uh, come here, when when Abdullah Faye says that, are you like listening? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Good good point. He's six six foot two Senegalese, <laughs> and he is strong as a horse. Yeah, I am not arguing with him. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, and is is there anything you can tell from how the team speaks to each other? In like, part of me thinks, and again, I'm not making a big deal out of this, but part of me thinks it's, it's quite good that a team has the ability to, in the middle of matches, dig each other out, as long as there's no repercussions. And that if the team was silent, like if Marcus Rashford didn't feel like he could give out to Harry Maguire, something wrong in the balance of power, if Fred isn't expecting some kind of tongue lashing from somebody when he makes a mistake, there's something wrong. I don't know. I'm just wondering, like, what's it like at City? Are they all giving each other grief when, you know, there's a bit of a, when there's a moment in a game? Or, or... Like, in the Ireland team, if things are going well, are you giving each other... Is it all positive, or is there some, come on, you need to do better than that? Like, what, what, what can you tell, if anything, from how the team speaks to each other? I think... I think you can often tell by the way... Um, if I use an example, like, if the way Harry speaks to Fred, that would suggest to me that Fred can take it. And certainly, he gives it back to him. Same with Marcus like Harry gives it to Mar or Marcus, you know, and vice versa. They can take it. Some fellas can't take it, and that's where you need to know. Like, can you imagine if Harry was screaming, shouting at Daniel James or, you know, Mason Greenwood? They might take it differently because they're, you know, the young lads, Dan James obviously had a tough time that it could affect their confidence. 
you'll always find that it's always the same kind of fellas. Like, you look at Bruno, like, as, as great as he is, he moans at everyone about everything. If he doesn't get the ball, you see him, there's the hands in the air, they come down. Um, a lot of lads will, they'll know it's nothing personal. Um, every nine out of ten won't take a personal, but there will be one that takes a personal. And then it's kind of like after the game, do you you kind of, you, you're you in the change room, you kind of know it to yourself, like, right, I've, I've given them a bit of tongue lashing or I've said something that maybe I shouldn't have said, that you just kind of nip in the bud right then and there. If you leave those things drag on, then that can be a problem. Um, because then, you know, lads are looking kind of going, well, he's this, that, and the other. Um, I'm not trying my hardest for him or it does it does happen um but like as we said there it's great you know it's a, it's, it's a bit of a throwback it just shows that you know people care and they want to win um like definitely definitely i'm not saying you guys but the press in england sometimes jump a bit all over it like it's kind of like a, it's a leading line like harry Maguire says this to fred oh my god there's uproar at united but it's not like that you know like, that's the thing if you look in the change room at half time can you imagine yesterday, you know, you know, the United Liverpool game? United weren't particularly playing that well. Um, the game was awful to watch, mind it was so like the amount of times the ball was turned over in possession. But can you imagine in in the United change room yesterday that people are just gonna sit down and not say anything to one another? You know, whether it been, you know, the ball was getting lost in midfield with McTominay or Fred or whatever. Like there's going to be like the defender's going to be like, come on lads, like you can't keep losing the ball, and then there there's going to be some fight back, um, which you'd expect. But it's good. I enjoy it. I like hearing it. Obviously, you know when I watched the cup final yesterday, you've got the fans. You don't hear as much anymore. I'm buzzing for the fans to be back, but I quite enjoyed listening. If you remember the famous one, I think it was BT released on telly was um, Bournemouth v Manchester United, and I think it's Ramsdale's in goal. And he's talking to. Um, do, do, do. Smith is it show Greenwood onto his right foot and then he sticks in the top corner but they had right verbals after but they released the full vintage, footage sorry like that stuff's good like I want to I want to see that I want to hear that because it shows to me that they care they want to do well and they want to win hmm. so, so when you're seeing Harry Maguire for example getting a little bit mouthy uh, in his role as Manchester United captain over the last little while is that just a, a quantum leap from the player that you played with? Has he come out of his shell completely over the last few years? Well, he, he's had to own. He's got. He's had to grow up. He's you know he's no captain of Manchester United. He takes the like he takes the responsibility. Obviously, there was that stuff that he was the one who approached Ed Woodward. You know, took the I don't know how how it went down. Was it Harry went to see him on his own? Did all the players go? Did they call him in a meeting room or whatever? But he's now captain of one of the biggest clubs in the world. He has to take on the responsibility. He has to. He's had to, you know, become a man almost. He has to be the one to take the, the slack. Manchester United have always had great captains over the years. Um, certainly, you know, you see the fans, how so they responded to that, which is a good sign for Harry because he has, yes, I think his performance has been a lot better this season, um, but he has come under a lot of stick. But he has certainly grown up and matured and he's taken on that, you know, added leadership and that, you know, sense of responsibility. Like we've had plenty of conversations on the show across different sports about the importance of a captain and whether or not it's just symbolic. I, I guess regardless of whether or not you have the armband, it is kind of what you make of it. It is kind of the leader that you are, whether it's verbally or whether it's leading by example. But in a sense, being a captain does matter, even if you're not the captain, even if there is a, a, a collection of different leaders across the pitch. No, 100%. Um, certainly when... You, you rely on your captain, certainly, when times are going tough. You know, when times are tough, sorry. Um, when you need someone to kind of take that, take on that added responsibility of, you know, give me the ball, I'm the man, I can I can shelter this. And then that, that confidence can filter into the team. Um, it's easy to be captain of a team when you're, when you're successful and you're going well. You look at Fernandinho yesterday, like... Um, he gets taken off, he hands the armband to De Bruyne, who then takes it off and hands it to Sterling. It's kind of they're passing around because they're all playing at such a high level and their performances have shown that they're they're gonna win games. It's when your captain, you really rely on your captain when your team isn't doing well and you're you're struggling that he has to be the man to front up. Um like obviously when I first came into the Ireland squad, Robbie Keane was captain, he was incredible at that. He knew how to give lads that little 
every person that was in the squad, probably bar John O'Shea, who'd been around a long time. Like Robbie was huge for us. Uh, Robbie could just turn and go, well done, you know, you're doing well, keep going. That was massive. Um, so the role of the captain is vital in a team. Certainly when it's easy when times are going well, it's when times are going tough that, you know, you need someone to be able to say what's required, whether that be positive or negative, to give someone that pick up the backside or to give that person that encouragement. I think Seamus is very good at it as well um, in the sense that he knows who to push, not to push, who needs that arm and who needs, you know, like I said, to kick up the backside. I think Maguire comes out really well from the last week and the Woodward stuff. Like that, that's, you know, the, the image of footballers over the last decade or so has largely, in a way, been ruined by agents who make them sound like prissy prima donnas who are detached from the world and all we think about them is in terms of the number of zeros at the end of their paycheck. But actually what happened was the footballers stood up for football against the owners of the clubs that they work for. And it was, as the stories start to be written and as we start to understand exactly how the whole thing fell apart, like, um, I, I personally feel that that's more important in some ways than the politicians railing against it because ultimately the politicians weren't going to be able to do anything and they only got on board after they realised the fans were against it. But the players were risking quite a lot. They were risking their relationship with the club. The next time that you're sitting down to do a contract, it's with the person you're going in to say, this doesn't make any sense. So I think when when the story is finalised, when we all kind of agree what the, the full thing, how it all happened and unfolded, um, those players, Jordan Henderson for calling that meeting, ultimately they didn't need to do it. But uh, him and, and Maguire and whoever else at Manchester United was helping with that, it's a it's a really huge thing for them, and in retrospect, it's going to be. Oh, definitely. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head there because it's very difficult. As much as managers of these clubs and the players were thrown under the bus, certainly the managers were. And the players are just being told that they kind of said, "Well, enough's enough. Um, we're not on board with this." Of course, we've seen the outrage from the fans across Europe, uh, mainly the UK, of course, because that's what we see. But the players certainly did step up. Um, obviously, that that whole thing with Harry going to see Ed Woodward, kind of sorting this out to say, look, we're not happy with this. And it's, it wasn't a case of it was one or two or three or four players. When a group of players is saying this is wrong, that that puts a wave through the club because then you're 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 at ends then because if the players aren't happy with what they're being told to do, like all BHS, Harry is the face of that and he's the one that's gone and had that conversation. But if he's got the backing of the rest of the team. That's a huge problem because you're inevitably trying to get players to do something they don't want to do, and that, that can only go for so long. And if it's one or two players, they could look to say, right in the summer, we can move them on and get rid of them or create the noise. But when it's a group, a squad, can you imagine if, as much as there was the uproar for the fans, but then if the club had turned on the players in certain circumstances, that would have added even more outrage. Um, so with, with moments like that, it is it is... You know, they do deserve credit. And, and like you said, Harry has come out really well from it because he has come under a lot of stick, um, which a lot of it hasn't been his fault. Not his fault. United paid 80 million for him. You know, obviously, Ali backs him, he made him captain, um, which is massive to be. Look, Harry knows that there's going to be the added responsibility of being captain of Manchester United. You look at some of the great captains they've had, it's going to be tough on him. It's going to be hard. But it was the same as, say, the other example uses Jordan Henderson. Like you take over from Steven Gerrard. It's not an easy person to follow. Um, and certainly, if the pair of them have really, probably Jordan is more ahead of Harry in terms of what he's done before, like certainly lifting the Champions League and the Premier League. Um, can you imagine if Harry is to go in there to win the Europa League, how big that would be for him in terms of his legacy as captain of Manchester United? Does the weekend's football make you want football even more, more football even more, the, the, the layer upon layer of games that we've got all season. Uh, it's not exactly been a great advertisement for adding more games onto the season, has it, what we saw at the weekend? No. There's only so much football I can watch now on the weekend. Um, it's just, just too much on. But then again, look at the circumstances we're in with the, you know, I know we're at the back end of the pandemic over here. Um, certainly, it's just every game is on television and you, only kind of picking out certain games. I think now once fans start to get back into stadiums, you've seen yesterday with the League Cup final, just 8,000 in Wembley to think that holds whatever it is, 94, 95,000. 
that they made a noise and you know you can see all the players the managers after speaking how great it was to have them back once fans start getting back into stadiums obviously I think the old TV companies will plug back the games they won't have as many on I think they've just kind of more or less done it for the pandemic and I'm certainly looking forward to being able to go to more games but I don't think I don't think we can sit down and watch four or five games on a Sunday anymore if you're Daniel Levy, do you regret how the last week went? Because all of a sudden, you were open to questions about whether or not Jose Mourinho should have been sacked last week. <sighs> Such a tough one, isn't it? You know, you're kind of, as people have said, like if you're if you're a Spurs fan and going into this cup final, you're looking for a manager to go and produce a performance against Pep Guardiola in a cup competition to you know, put on this man managerial masterclass of finding a way to defeat them. Kind of fella you'd look for is Jose Mourinho. I definitely do think there's more going on behind the scenes. There's been a lot of rumours about that positioning the table meant his payoff was so much. Um, that if he'd been in the top six or the top four, it was higher. If he'd won a cup, kind of, I think it was all box ticked, kind of leading into the cup final that if he'd won a trophy, he was entitled to so much money. So you don't know, and we all know one thing we do know is Daniel Levy is a businessman. It is a strange one, um, albeit I'm, look, I said the other day, Ray Mason's obviously a friend of mine and former teammate, so I was happy for him to be given this opportunity. But, you know, as much as Ryan spoke during the week about wanting to play the Tottenham way and see he's Tottenham through and through, it just felt like a Jose Mourinho performance, everything about it, you know, um, it was poor. Spurs never really looked like causing you know, Man City much problems. If Man City had their shooting boots on in front of goal, it could have been a landslide. Um, it's just, it was complete another domination from City. Who, who do you then blame for that Jose Mourinho type performance? Is it the, the legacy of Jose Mourinho? Can, can that have such a footprint on a team that even when a new manager it takes a while to get out of that? Or are the players actually the ones to blame for what's happened, for not kicking on after Pochettino left? It's very difficult to, you know, point fingers. Um, look, there was many times it was highlighted that, you know, the Pochettino shouldn't give money to invest or reinvest, you know, in the squad to add new players to kind of take them on to the next level. Obviously, they went a different direction with Mourinho. He's added some players. Um, I think Ryan would probably see them through this season and they'll look at a point in someone for preseason. You know, you talk about the stamp that Mourinho's put in the squad. And that was evident from yesterday's performance. Certainly, if a manager came in, he gets preseason, and gets time to you know bring across his philosophy and his methods. Um, you know, he has plenty of time to work with them going into the new season. It's just a case of who do Tottenham you know hire. Obviously, the one that's been linked a lot is Nagelsmann, but they're they're tipping him now to take over Bayern Munich. So it's a case of where do where do they go for now? Where do they go from here? I mean, at least they were looking and in the right direction. If if Nagelsmann ends up with Bayern, they're like, okay, well, well, you know, we're, we're our selection process is good here. Let's not just get the next celebrity who's available to us, um, who's out of work for whatever reason. There, there's news this morning. The Premier League have announced that Thierry Henry and Alan Shearer have become the first two players inducted into the Premier League Hall of Fame. Um, you know, this is going to bring back that whole debate about football only starting in, in 1992. Did you ever play against Henri? Was that, uh, did you did you miss him or did you get up against him? No, I never played against him. Um, I was at Sunderland when he came back. I remember if that loan move um, he had back from, I think it was the MLS. Um, what's a player though? Um, I think it was, it was always inevitable that they were going to bring a really Hall of Fame. I think it was probably just picking boxes and make sure they could do it. Um, Phenomenal. I know a lot of Irish people haven't forgiven him for the handball. But I often ask myself, would I have done the same to get Ireland to a World Cup? And I would have. So I don't really have too many complaints about that. But In, certainly, certainly what a special player he was. Is he slightly underrated? Like, have we forgotten just how sensational he was? That, like, he was the best player on the team that put it up to Alex Ferguson's Manchester United for, you know, five, six, seven seasons? Well... I haven't forgotten about him. I don't think a lot of people have. I think the younger generation, like you said, they haven't seen enough of him. You know, you see clips, whether it be Premier League greats or classic games or whatever, you see little bits and pieces of him. Um, but anyone who's watched any bit of the Premier League, you know, Henri, certainly one of the best players to ever play in it, arguably the best. Um, so I don't think he's underrated, no. Um, 
he was he was exceptional. The stuff he used to do with a ball, and he always played with a smile on his face. Like he's six foot three, and he's so fast. He can go either way. You know his finishing. You know that that finish that outside the right foot just passes. You know past the goalie is is renowned as the Henri finish. Um, he was he was a joke. Uh, there's, they've obviously done Henri and Shearer first, but next, I mean, next has to be Roy Keane. And if they're doing them two at a time, it has to be Keane and Gerrard, but it has to be Keane next. Whatever happens next, Roy Keane has to be next in the Premier League Hall of Fame, right? Ah, look, look, my opinion, I'd have, of course, Roy should be in there, but whether or not they'll put Roy in that soon is another thing. Um, I think they'll probably tick the boxes of England internationals. Um, you're kind of your Wayne Rooney's, your Frank Lampard's, your Stephen Gerrard's. I think they'll end up getting in ahead of other people because obviously they're iconic English players. As we know, English players will be favoured over Irish players. Certainly, when you talk about Hall of Fame players in the Premier League, Roy Keane is definitely up there. You know, seven league titles, four as a captain, that stuff is unheard of. Um phenomenal but then you you look at the great Manchester United teams there's an argument then for Gary Neville and Paul Scholes those boys you know Ryan Giggs of course um there's loads of fellas there's no doubting Roy Keane will be inducted into the Hall of Fame at some stage which is the case of win yeah don't uh, add insult to injury uh, Premier League stick them in straight away David good stuff this morning we didn't even get to talk about uh, Liverpool and their difficulties but luckily there's a month left of the season and they haven't made it to the Champions League and it looks like they aren't so we have plenty of time to delve into that over the next few weeks. Cheers. Cheers, guys. David Myler giving us his thoughts there. Uh, the uh, Hall of Fame is a nice little distraction for everybody to talk about when the quality of the football wasn't great at the weekend. Like, I mean, this is, uh, it's a good idea because at this point every year, people tend to maybe lose a little bit of interest in the Premier League. It doesn't help when you got a terrible weekend to look back on, but I do think some like very regularly you get a bit of a procession to the title and having this sort of conversation in and around March or April every year wouldn't be a bad move from from the Premier League standpoint. So they're kind of they're kind of moving with the times a little bit. I think anything that you see in American sports there's always going to be some variation of it over here. Ah, but what was it Big Sam said, we're Britain not America. Mm. Well, uh, if Big Sam gets inducted into the Premier League Hall of Fame he will uh, happily wave his uh, Union Jack. Uh, I mean, that's a good question, right? So if they're going to put managers in, does Big Sam make it? <laughs> Never been relegated? This season he's going to get relegated, that last-minute equaliser for Villa last night. Uh, well, actually, you talk about Roy Keane being the next man in. The next man in should be Alex Ferguson. If they're going if they're to... If they're doing managers, if yeah. they're, they're, Maybe not, but... Well, if they're doing managers, you put... You put and if they're doing them two at a time... Ferguson and Wenger. You do. And you've got to put Jose in. You got Jose one hundred percent in yeah. there, but but his story ain't fully told yet. Maybe no, that's true. So they've got to be retired, and there should be a, a there should be a time limit on when they retired. I mean, look, I, I think that it's clear they'll put Beckham in before Keane. Here we are talking about it, getting sucked in. Look, look at how easily we're oh, distracted. I'm, I'm here for it. I'm 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 absolutely going to get sucked in by this and and talk about it. Fourteen minutes past eight this morning. The comments coming in thick and fast. Um, Bonnie asks, "What's a fair punishment for the greedy six? The Greedy Six are being praised for the speed at which they got back on board by UEFA at this point. So I don't think there's going to be any punishment for those clubs. I think that um, the piss and vinegar of the uh, annoyance is, is dying out slowly because the football came back. Champions League this week. Imagine if there's two English teams in the Champions League final. It's possible. It is possible. Um, that there might be two English teams in the Champions League final. What's going to happen at that point? Will, will everybody be saying... All these clubs need to not be allowed to play in this competition next year, so we'll punish the fans and players. I, I, I can't see there being any punishment. They've taken, um, they've taken their uh, various executives off some high-powered committees in the Premier League. They'll be back on next year because by ostracising them and isolating them further, you're just going to make them talk to each other more and go, well, it didn't work out this time. What are we going to do next time? So I don't know. Yeah, like, I mean, the, the the move here is to absolutely take what you've got and run because they're backtracking and they have been backtracking for the last week, those Premier League executives. If you give them a further punishment, 
all of a sudden they feel that they need to get their revenge as well, they'll start to get pissed off. It's not fair, but that's how they'll start to think and uh, the likelihood of this rearing its head again will be higher. A transfer ban would be uh, pretty amazing if they could do that. Wayne Ryan says, Bielsa for Spurs, please. Imagine yesterday if he had that team. I mean, Bielsa for Spurs would be an incredible experiment, but one that I can't see Daniel Levy getting into at this point. It's 15 minutes past eight. We'd love to hear from you. 0879 180 180. OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. We're going to be talking uh, plenty of rugby on the show and loads more Irish rugby star Stacey Flood's going to join us next. We've got Alan Quinlan a little bit later on. We've got the uh, Gillette power rankings and loads more to come. Stay tuned. TB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so. Ah, uh, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna auto mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. Check out the Boyle Sports app today for details on which football match is getting the no-lose treatment this week. Plus, browse through dozens of new player markets, all powered by Opta. Shots on target, left foot, right foot, headed goals, assists and more. See the Boyle Sports app for full T's and C's. Boyle Sports. This is betting. Gamble responsibly. See gamblingcare.ie 18 plus. The Women's Six Nations is here and OTB Sports is your one-stop shop for all the best coverage, analysis and opinion. As Ireland take on Wales and France to decide their position on finals day we will bring you a special weekly six nations show with some of the great names of the game as well as special interviews with irish legends sophie spence and rosie foley with reporters at the games all the latest team news match previews and much much more check out otbsports.com forward slash women six nations otb am with gillette put your best face forward with our new and improved razors a quick run through the sports pages for you this morning here on OTB AM. It's uh, 17 minutes past eight for you. Going to start with the Irish uh, Daily... We can start with otbsport.com if we have it. Uh, if we don't, we'll start with the Daily Mail this morning. The Quad Squad. Pep wins fourth League Cup in a row and then tells City to make it a trophy treble this season. Andy Friend hits out at Ulster Captain's Challenge. Leave it alone. That's a footy collision. Brian Kerr's passionate monologue on racism is a must-watch. And Guardiola says it's amazing to win fourth consecutive Carabao Cup in front of fans. We're 8,000 fans in Wembley from... Uh, both, uh, just very quickly again, the Daily Mail, they have the line from uh, Michal Martin, the Taoiseach, giving out about UEFA. Um, that's uh, Philip Lanigan's piece. Uh, I thought UEFA were out of order, quite frankly, putting that condition on countries. If you look at what's happening all over Europe in terms of the B117 and in terms of the high incidence in European member state countries, to sort of be putting obligations on countries to force spectators in prematurely, in my view, was the wrong call by the footballing authorities. Um, but UEFA did give half a million to the Daily Mount refurbishment project, so um, swings and roundabouts, I guess. Maybe we could have got five million from them. Irish Independent, uh, Spurs said to miss out on number one target to add to cup final pain. We've just been talking about this. Julian Nagelsmann could well be the next Bayern Munich manager, and that is the uh, moment of the equaliser in the Scottish Cup game last night where Xander Clark, the St Johnston goalkeeper, scores against Rangers in the 120th minute after extra time and uh, then goes on to um, Johnson. Johnson's going to win 4-2 in the penalty shootout. The Irish Sun, uh, Pep's in a super league of his own with four consecutive League Cup wins. Why is he so obsessed with the League Cup? Or is it just because they're the best team? Is that what happens? Maybe it is. The Times, the London Times, they have that Maguire blasted idiot Fred, Masters plan for Queens at the tennis tournament, and Pep, now I want to treble. Uh, City aim for the stars. Emmerich Laporte uh, with the goal last night to give them the 1-0 lead. That's the mirror, the star. Uh, lap of honour. Emmerich's header keeps Pep's treble bit alive. Ole, it's no distraction. Two billion stolen. Hashtag Glazer out was the um, message flown over by plane. Back page of the Guardian there is Pep talk. Guardiola to the city to take cup glory into battle. And then the rest of them are kind of as you'd expect. The examiner... Their front cover, that'll tell you what kind of a weekend it was. Back in the swing, Kevin Markham's county by county guide to golf's return. Uh, so, what time is it at? 20 minutes past eight here. I'm delighted to say that one of Irish rugby's newest stars, Stacey Flood, is with us in just a second. First, here's another Dorothy Wall reflecting on the Six Nations campaign. 
Look, I think some things went our way and others didn't. And we probably grew through that period. Like there was a huge hype around the first match and it, it went our way. The second match didn't. And we finished with a win. So it was a bit of a roller coaster, but we finished on the right side of it. And look, we have a huge 18 months ahead of us. So this is a good time to look back and review at what we did well, what we didn't do well and how we can become better as a team. Stacey Flo, good morning to you. How are you? Morning. Hi. Uh, what kind of a what kind of a celebration is there at the end of a Six Nations like that where you're not really allowed to celebrate? But there was a bit of relaxation around the weekend. So were you all able to at least kind of gather and spend some time or was it straight back home and kind of no actual chance to hang out together? Um, obviously after full time we went back into the dress room and said a few things to each other and obviously celebrated the win but uh, just back to the hotel had dinner and then dispersed off this time anyway so. So not, as, <laughs> not as much crack as you might have anticipated after a, a big win at the end because there was a bit of pressure in the build up yeah look the day will come to have a, a bit of crack after and hopefully uh, restrictions ease off soon enough for us to get that opportunity but stay safe for now <laughs> and what was the pressure like in the build up to that game because so much was riding on it yeah, look, um, I think you have to block out while everyone on the outside is playing and just get your pers like your personal performance in and really focus on like what the group wants to achieve out of the game. So you kind of have to block out the outside media stuff and just focus on the game plan itself and just trying to get a performance in. So yeah, pressure's for tires. <laughs> When it came to your own performance uh, at the weekend, Stacey, how much of this was uh, a moment for you where you thought, this is my arrival now, this is a, a huge opportunity for me, or had the build coming off the bench over the last couple of weeks, had that actually eased you into it to the point where there wasn't a whole pile of individual pressure on you? Yeah, look, being in the last few months with the girls, um, I feel like they, we've really, well, I've really learned a lot of them. And um, obviously it's, kind of easier coming off the bench because there's less pressure on you as a player so you can kind of come on and do your thing and then getting the start in the last game I I, I was trying not to feel the pressure um, and just focus on the performance but it got to game day and I showed up and I think I'd forgotten my GPS vest my presentation jacket because I was so focused on just getting the like getting the game plan right and coming on and doing well so um yeah, hope, they're only little things I forgot, but <laughs> came on focused on the game plan. So, um, yeah, look, we're happy with a win, but I actually think um, we didn't even show what we can really do, which is really exciting in a way because there's so much more to build on and there's so much more to show everyone what we can do. So, yeah, that's exciting. Can I just ask them the, the difference between coming off the bench and starting? When you're coming off the bench, is it easier in a way because you get to suss out what the opposition are doing, who's going well, the sort of openings that you might be able to find in the defence, whereas when you're in there from the start, you've only got your a, a more one-dimensional view, I guess, because you're right up close to it. Yeah, so coming off the bench, I'd say, obviously, if the game's going well, it's easy on you as well because mm -hmm. um, you just have to come on and finish it off for the girls and be that little bit of an impact. And um, When it wasn't going well against the French, I was like, Look, just come on and try play some ball and see what we can do. See if we can test them. Like as a sub, you don't want to come on and just blend in. You want to come on and make that impact and help the girls who have been on the field for 60, 70 minutes and just try give them a bit of a lift with you. So um yeah, it's a bit of a difference. Um but when we go in a half time, if you're starting, uh, we kinda have a little hot review and kind of see what the subs think and what the manager and coaches think like that we can do for the second half so you kind of get that even though you're so up close to it you kind of get that little review and what they think we need to do in the second half as well so all right so people, so those on the bench are actually feeding input into you at half time oh definitely like those girls are great for that and even when we were on the bench like it's the players like they know your game plan they know what we want to do so when we're coming in at half time and they're like I saw this and I'm like, oh, really? Like, I didn't actually see that because you're so close and personal on the field. Mm. Um, so then they're like, oh, there's space here. So you're like, oh, that's brilliant. Like, I'll have a look for it now. And they just plant the seed in your head and you can have a go then. <laughs> and does it work? Um, yeah, you'd like to think so. You'd hope so. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, overall, like, is this uh, a Six Nations that you look back on massively positively? Like, I, I guess the the attention on the team ratcheted up as as things went on. The the France performance, I'm sure, was disappointing from your perspective. But as Ger alluded to there, there was a sense this Italian team was really coming and getting the win against them on Saturday. I'm sure you just come away from the whole thing feeling really positive about life. Yeah, like uh, as Dorothy just said, um, it was definitely a roller coaster. Um, there's so much of a build, a build into the games, which just lets us so much for a drop off after. But I'd say two out of three is a positive campaign for us. And obviously we have plenty to work on for the season ahead, but we know what we need to do and what we need to work on, which is the best thing about game time. And yeah, I'd say it's a positive campaign and happy to build on that and see what can evolve in the next few months for us. Stacey, your, your own background is a GA background primarily. Is that where you would have come through kind of as, from a, an athletic perspective? Um, yeah, look, when I was younger, I would try try anything. Um, my mom actually wanted me to be a dancer, but I uh, soon realised I was not a dancer. Um, but my older sister, Kim uh, Flood, was playing uh, GAA and I was like, oh my God, she's so good. I just really want to play. <laughs> And um, so I started playing GAA and then came up the ranks. Um, obviously with Clannagale Fontenay as my club and um, got put on all the Dublin trials and stuff and made a few of the teams, played Dublin minor. And then when I turned 18, um, I had started dabbling in rugby at 17 uh, to keep fit for GAA actually, um, funny enough. But uh, when I turned 18, I was offered a sevens full-time contract. So. I've been on that adventure ever since now, kind of take going wherever it takes me, yeah. So the sevens pathway is really important for the senior 15s team. It's a, it's a way to talent scout good quality athletes who will have some ball skills, who might be able to transfer that into the senior team. And how long, how long have you been with the sevens before you actually were uh, brought into the senior team? Um, I've been playing sevens full on for um, six, six years now. Um, I've been contracted since I'm 18 and then obviously with uh, COVID this year um, we got the opportunity to because we weren't allowed to travel with sevens because it's, obviously it's a hot weather sport so we don't really usually play it in Ireland um, so uh, I got to start with the 15s this year fully um, and get a lot of training in with the girls which was so beneficial even as a sevens player like the skills transfer over um, you just have to learn that tactical element of the 15s game. So we, I was I was glad, and I know the other sevens girls who got to transfer over um, were glad to get that opportunity. And just to make it one program, uh, I think, is so beneficial for women's rugby. And the player pool just increases for that green jersey and competition. And you just get to drive each other on, try earn a uh, cap for your country, which is the best thing at the end of the day. And I don't know what, what the future holds. Is it Can you do a little bit of both or do you become one specifically or what happens next? Um, look, both are priority and that's what's great about rugby. Um, and obviously the squads interlink. Uh, so hopefully we get to rest, refocus and then we're back into sevens, which is exciting uh, to see some of the girls I haven't seen during the Six Nations, but just if something comes up for sevens or fifteens and just the prior like neither are priority, they're just um just kind of build into that World Cup next year for both the sevens and fifteens World Cup next year. And they're at different times. So hopefully we'll get to be involved in both, which is the goal of having it as one programme. Is there any idea when the next game is for the fifteens? Um so we have a six week uh, rest now and then we'll go back into camps in preparation for that World Cup qualifier for the New Zealand World Cup next year. Um, we're not actually fully sure when that date is, but we know it's around the summertime. So, yeah. And this team has been pretty used to training for a long period of time without without games. I, I guess it's back into that now for the next little while. Yeah, definitely. And look, it's probably a blessing in disguise that we got all those camps together because you'd never have that opportunity. Um, so it's like a silver lining, really. I know it's been a little bit out of people's control, but how important would it be for the club game to get back up and running in this country to get match minutes rather than training constantly for a game that, as you say, we're not even sure when it's going to take place? 
yeah, look, obviously, I think grassroots and club rugby are so important to build the game in Ireland. And I actually think um, the Six Nations being a standalone tournament this year has brought way more attention to it. And it'll hopefully get so many more young girls playing and get them into their grassroots rugby and into the club rugby system. And hopefully the clubs can get up back up and running soon. And we can get a bit of game time with them as well. So we'll see where that goes, depending on restrictions. Yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, I think it's a good point you make. The, the higher visibility for this brings with its huge opportunities and huge benefits for the clubs and for hopefully the provinces and for the sevens team. And, and it just, it, you know, if it's all managed properly, then it's all heading in one direction. There's obviously going to be criticism and difficulties along the way, but that's, that's what comes with increased uh, attention, increased... Um, people talking about it. That's just Irish life, right? Yeah, look, um, obviously everyone wants the women's game to grow and get better. So I think that's just a focus and hopefully it starts to get better and grow and the systems will get running when the restrictions are lifted and everyone will start playing more rugby, especially um, if it's like your friends are watching and you, you want to have a go with them. And it's really important for younger girls like obviously I started I think I was six, 16, 17 when I started playing rugby and I, I think I just got in at the right age um, but you can see the likes of Bavin, like Dorothy, Amy Lee Murphy Crow, Eve Higgins like they all started playing young and it's just so natural to them the way GAA would be natural to me so I think the younger you get in the better and obviously the club systems coming up and AIL getting started will be massively um, a boost for the squad and for the country as well. Well, listen, Stacey, congratulations on the start and on the win at the weekend. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Bye. Uh, Stacey Flood there talking about Ireland's victory against the Italians at the weekend in the final game of the Six Nations. It's 8.32 this morning, and we mentioned this a little bit earlier on, the hour-long Kevin McStay interview from Sunday's OTB. Well worth checking out. The full podcast is available on the OTB Podcast Network. Just go to OTB GAA. You can search that and uh, subscribe to that, you'll get it there. It's also available on the Off The Ball YouTube channel, so youtube.com forward slash off the ball. Here's McStay talking about the influence of the army on his coaching style. Um, well, you know, when we go to college and uh, to the, the military colleges, they teach all the different models uh, of leadership and styles. Of it. But a friend of mine a long time ago kind of said, you know, it's going to be very hard to beat old fashioned good example. And I'd like to think that's the that's the way I'd be, um, you know, that I'd be up in time, I'd be dressed appropriately, I'd be knowledgeable in my brief, whatever it was I had to attend to. I'd know my men, I'd know everything about them. Um, when I say men, I mean men and women, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd know everything about them, whether they were married, how they were doing at home. I'd have a, I'd have a, a real interest in them, and I hope a, a, an empathy with them, and I'd be as firm and uh, as fair as I could be. Um, and that would be that would be my way of going about it. I, I, you know that there would be nothing you'd ask them to do that you wouldn't be willing to do yourself. And that that whole idea of of, of putting them definitely before your 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 needs mm. and, and wants, and that they would that, you know they would be out. It's like, it's almost like sports management. You know, mm. the players have to be out first. You know, the the leaders the leaders eat last, and that's just that's just that's the way it has to be. And I, I, you know, I had, I had great relationships with, with my troops overseas. I like to think I had anyway. I suppose we'd have to ask them. But I, I pretty much know I had, and, and they, they enjoy their time with me as I did with them. And um, yeah, my, my superiors and subordinates, I got on really well with on those trips. And you have to because it's a, it's a very enclosed environment, and uh, people have to get on. Mm. And I, I think that might be one of my, my, my best attributes. I get on with people. I'm interested in people. Um, and I'm in interested in their circumstances. Yeah, really interesting stuff there from Kevin McStay. You can, as I said, see that whole thing on youtube.com forward slash off the ball, or you can subscribe on the OTB Sports app to the OTB J podcast feed, and you'll get it there. 34 minutes past eight this morning, and Neil Tracy is with us. Neil, good morning to you. How are you? I'm good, guys. How are you? I was just saying at the start of the show, I arrived in to see the two of you screaming at each other, butting chess, going, Johan van Graan's red and white army. You know, Van Grand's Red and White Army, and I'm surprised that either of you have a voice left after the celebrations at the weekend. Yeah, yeah, that that is exactly what happened this morning <laughs> when uh, when you walked into myself and Owen in the office. No, it was uh, 
it was it was an enjoyable win. Now it wasn't a particularly brilliant game of rugby. It was a little bit scrappy in the first half, but um, exactly what Munster needed, I think, to be honest. Even though you know, as we kind of have pointed out, Leinster had a lot of players rested. You know, it was a weakened selection. They had kind of a mix of a few first teamers and some second and third choice guys. But uh, I think very very importantly for Munster when they had that lead going into the second half like looking back at games in in the past couple of years when Munster have had a lead against Leinster or have, have done well in the first half against them and they've struggled in the second half and Leinster have reeled them in and in a few cases actually just been held scoreless for 40, 40 to 60 minute periods in the game it was very very important I think for the team themselves that they kicked on in the second half and, and dominated the second 40 minutes and it's exactly what they did. Uh, like Damien De Allende as well, just he was just unbelievable. And I think what's so fantastic about him is his ability to be so physical around the pitch in terms of his defence and what he contributes at, at the breakdown. He's a complete nuisance. He's getting in the way of people. But it seems like when he has the ball in his hands and when he has a little bit of space in front of him, he's incredibly light on his feet. Like he attacks so differently to the way he defends, which is what kind of makes him such an enjoyable player to watch as well. But yeah, overall, fine start for Munster. It's not going to change too much, as I, I don't think, in the you know the, the landscape of Irish rugby or European club rugby. But I think just an important step for a lot of those players, particularly some of the younger guys like Gavin Coombs and Craig Casey, to be involved in a big game against Leinster like that and to get that win as well is probably important for them. Yeah, no, for sure. What else is going on today? Uh, plenty of reaction, I suppose, the weekend. Man City manager Pep Guardiola says no time to savour the League Cup success. They're targeting more silverware. They beat Spurs 1-0 yesterday thanks to a late Emmerich Laporte header securing a record equaling fourth League Cup title in a row. City are closing in as well as we know on the Premier League title and they face PSG in the semi-finals of the Champions League this week. And Guardiola says they're desperate for success on multiple fronts. We are two games away to be or to try to win again the most important title of the season. So the Premier League is the nicest one, is one of them I'm proud the most when we were able to do it and uh, we are so close. And their march towards the Premier League title could be complete as early as this Sunday. They're now 10 points clear at the top after Manchester United's goalless draw away to Leeds yesterday afternoon. The title would be confirmed this weekend if Man City beat Crystal Palace and if United lose against Liverpool. The relegation picture is also starting to look a bit clearer. West Brom's survival bid now looks doomed after they gave up a late equaliser to neighbours Aston Villa. It leaves them nine points from safety with just five games left to play. While Burnley's Premier League status looks all but secure now after they hammered Wolves 4-0. A first half Chris Wood hat-trick helped them pull nine points clear of the drop zone and they're now up to 14th place in the table as well. The remaining game from the Premier League weekend sees Leicester City host Crystal Palace at 8 o'clock tonight. A win for Leicester would see them consolidate third place and pull seven points clear in the race for Champions League football. In Scotland, Rangers' hopes of a league and cup double came to an end last night. They were beaten 4-2 on penalties by St. Johnston in the Scottish Cup quarterfinal at Ibrox. Joining St. Johnston in tonight's semi-final draw are Hibernian and Dundee United, while Kilmarnock face St. Mirren in the last of the quarterfinals as well this evening. In rugby, Leinster head coach Leo Cullen says it's too early to say whether Johnny Sexton or Caelan Doris will be available for Sunday's Heineken Champions Cup semi-final against La Rochelle. Sexton sat out the weekend defeat to Munster as he continues to, re- the, to go through the return to play protocols after the head injury he sustained against Exeter in the quarter-final win a couple of weeks back. Cullen says the out half will continue to go through all the required tests before a call is made. And he also says they'll monitor the injury picked up by Caelan Doris, the calf injury. He was a late withdrawal from the team to play Munster. At the World Snooker Championships, the quarterfinal lineup will be complete tonight. Favourite Judd Trump needs just two more frames to secure his place in the last eight, leading Dave Gilbert 11 5 going into this afternoon session. And 2014, 2015 champion Stuart Bingham has a 10 6 advantage over Jamie Jones when they resume at 1 o'clock. And then tonight, Antrim's Mark Allen trails Mark Selby nine frames to six in their second round match. 2005 champion Sean Murphy also leads China's Yan Bing Tao 10 frames to 6. And the first to 13 frames in all those matches will advance the quarterfinals at the Crucible. And finally then, there's an eight race card at Nace this afternoon. The first there, Jerk was off at 25 past 1. There was a minor controversy about the captain's challenge in the game between Connacht and Ulster on Friday night. Am I getting my nights right? I am, yeah. Um, what was the 
crack here, and this is a new rule, obviously, that is, has been introduced for the Rainbow Cup. There's a bunch of new rules that are being trialled for the Rainbow Cup. It didn't seem to have that much of an impact on the uh, Leinster game, but what was the what is the situation here, and, and why was Andy Friend saying this is not something that he wants to see more of? I'll, I'll, I'll be light on the details with just this church, to be honest, because I do want to actually go into detail on them tomorrow okay. on the Tide 5, because that was one of the one of the things I pointed out, because there was a there was a decision in the Munster-Leinster game as well that caused a lot of confusion about the interpretation of what was and wasn't allowed to be challenged. So I'll save that one for tomorrow. But on the Connacht one, Andy Friend, he just wasn't happy with the way Ulster used their challenge. So it was after Ulster had scored one of their tries and they alerted the referee to what they believed was a dangerous tackle by Abraham Papali, the Connacht number eight. Now, when they went back and looked at it, obviously the referee had to accept the challenge and go and look at it. It was actually a perfectly, perfectly good tackle. It was below the shoulders. He hit him bloody hard, is is all I'll say about it. And I think what Andy Friend probably just wasn't happy about is that Ulster, it seemed they probably just used Papali's reputation against him because he's had a red card and a yellow card already in the last, like since he joined Connacht back in August, uh, both of those for dangerous tackles. And he's one of these guys coming from a rugby league background who has had to work a lot on his tackle technique because they are tackling a lot higher uh, regularly in rugby league. And I think Andy Friend just wasn't really happy that it was probably Papali's reputation that went before him. And he was a bit disappointed with the, I suppose maybe the sportsmanship of Ulster making that challenge, considering they just scored a try as well, is probably what he wasn't too pleased about. But look, in fairness, at the other uh, a few minutes later, Connacht went up the pitch and used their captain's challenge absolutely brilliantly. It was a last play of the game, a knock-on rule against Michael Lowry. Owen Masterson, I believe it was, he was standing in as captain at the time. He explained the situation really, really well to the referee, Andy Brace, what he wanted to challenge. They went up, they had a look at it. It turns out that Michael Lowry had stripped the ball on the ground. He played it on the ground. Penalty Connacht. They go down the pitch a minute or so later and they score a try. I, d- I actually missed that try at the time, uh, if I just finish up on saying this, because... 78 and a half minutes were on the clock in that game. Ulster were leading. They were down in Connacht's territory, just seeing out time. And I said, having watched the entire game of what was actually a brilliant game as well, I said, ah, there's only a minute or so, a minute or so here. Ulster will see out this bit of possession and they'll win it. I'll flick over and I'll catch the end of the snooker. And five minutes later, I was checking my Twitter and I see Connacht had won the game. That's the way it goes, unfortunately. <laughs> That's up there with George Best walking out in the new Camp when it was 1-0 to Bayern Munich in 1999. <laughs> yeah, I got caught rotten. I won't do it again. Neil, good stuff. Thanks a million. We're looking forward to the Tie 5 tomorrow and getting more detail on the law changes in the games that we're seeing at the moment in the Rainbow Cup. That's uh, Neil Tracy with us this morning at 8.43. Um, and we'll have the Type 5 for you at 5 past 9 on tomorrow's OTB AM. Brian O'Driscoll joins off the ball tonight. It'll be live streamed across the OTB channels from 5.45 p.m. this evening. And it's on the radio show, Off the Ball on News Talk from 8 o'clock this evening. A reminder, OTB AM, live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. The performance rankings are coming up in just a couple of minutes' time. Leeds and Manchester United was live on Sunday's OTB. Brian Kerr joins Stephen Doyle on commentary. Here's Kerr on Bruno Fernandes looking burnt out with all the football. Just one goal and one assist in the last eight matches now in the Premier League for Bruno Fernandes. When you look at his, at his performances over that stretch of games, is there anything you can kind of see which would lead you to point out what is actually going wrong for him at the moment? Because they need a big performance from him if they're going to knock Rome out of the Europa League. Well, you have a player here who's come into Manchester United and had an incredible impact from the time he came in, he came in in the, in the in the winter window more or less, and he had a massive impact. And he's continued that this season. He's on 16 goals, playing the number 10 position off the front. So many goals and, and assists, as they call them now, making a few goals for other fellas too. Um, but he's also an ever present as regards the number of games he's played. And he's going from one Manchester United game to another every game, plays every game, plays all the. He looks like he gets upset if he gets left out of the Europa League game in midweek. And then he, he goes out and plays the international team for Portugal. So if you were pointing to something, I'd say, how high are his main energy levels? Does he need to, to be managed a little bit? Um, <coughs> excuse me, his time on the pitch managed a little bit better. I mean, obviously Manchester United's sport, strength and condition and sports science and background, they know what they're doing, but that's all I can put it down to. And of course, the opposition been more intent on 
in in uh, clamping down on his influence in games. And the longer he plays in the league, the more they know about him. But equally, he knows how he can, how efficient he can be against different opposition. But he's certainly finding it a bit harder at the moment. But that's no surprise. He's been a great player, and if he can influence Manchester United for the rest of this season, they've got up from third last year to second this season, Europa League final. Uh, sorry, Europa League semi-final. Can they win this competition? Can he guide them to win the competition? Let's let's wait and see. But he's been a great player for them. I think this is this is just temporary. Yeah, hopefully it's just temporary because we uh, do like to watch Bruno playing good football. Uh, so Man United play Roma on Thursday at eight o'clock. Villarreal Arsenal are kicking off at the same time. Um, Villarreal beaten by. Barca, but they put it up to them at the weekend in La Liga. Those uh, some very sensational goals in that game um, um, from Barca in particular. So we're we're digging that out. Are you feeling confident as an Arsenal fan? On no, absolutely not. I think there's a good chance to get knocked out by Villarreal actually in this. Uh, the the eggs, the Arsenal eggs have been in this Europa League basket for quite some time now. The, the desperate start to the season really kind of rode off any chance at the top four. And really, I mean, you would have thought that Europa League qualification would have come eventually. Even as the season's raged on, you're like, oh God, the Europa League qualification isn't even going to come. They're not even going to launch a, a late charge for that. Would you rather lose the semi-final against Villarreal or lose the final against Manchester United? <sighs> like, I mean, I don't care, to be honest. Like, it's it, like one or the other. I, I, I guess it'd be nice to maybe have a final, but like, to, to lose another one. I know that they lost to Chelsea a couple of seasons ago and like... I don't know. Like, does making a final represent progress? I, I guess not losing to Unai Emery will be good, uh, but like losing to Manchester United will be bad. Like, I mean, like the thing is, if they get to the final, taking four points off Manchester United this season in the Premier League, it's a team that Arteta has beaten. It's like there, there are plenty of opposition that you could pick around Europe that could possibly hockey Arsenal. I'm not sure if United are actually one of those teams. I think when United control the ball and when they have the lion's share of possession, that's actually when Arsenal could be dangerous against them. So. I'd be quite concerned about the, the Villarreal two legs, to be quite honest with you. But if they get over that, I'd, I'd actually give them every chance of, of winning the final. But things just don't look great at the moment at the club. Obviously, you had the massive protest on Friday before the game against Everton. The game itself, Everton beat Arsenal. And when it comes to these games, there's no sense of shock about them anymore, Everton beating them. I know they West Ham only drew at Arsenal, but when they were 3-0 up uh, against them a few weeks back, you were like, fair enough. And it's an overachievement, it feels, when Arsenal put in a really good performance against Spurs like they did a month ago, or, uh, as I say, getting four points off United this season. But teams like Everton and West Ham are kind of having better seasons than Arsenal because they're better than Arsenal at the moment. And that's, that's a, a really bad reflection of how poor the season has been from them. The other big news is, of course, that um, the guy who founded Spotify tweeted on Friday that he has been a lifelong Arsenal fan and he's actually interested in it. And there's some news this morning on that. Yeah, uh, Matt Law from the Daily Telegraph says, I have it on good authority that Thierry Henry, Dennis Burkamp, and Patrick Vieira have joined Daniel Ek in his bid to buy Arsenal. And I'm told that it's very real. So the Spotify owner, who is a massive Arsenal fan, uh, would be up for purchasing if the Cronkies are up for selling. So the point here is that you're going to get rid of one group of billionaires to replace them with another group of billionaires. It's just you hope that this billionaire will be a good billionaire and not try and get you into the Super League, but actually you want to be in the Super League if all the other teams are setting up a Super League. So as an Arsenal fan, you're like, well, the Cronky year is over. I mean, this isn't happening, by the way, just for, this isn't ha happening. It's just a idle speculation, a bit of a tweet and some meetings between uh, famous footballers and, and uh, a, a tech bro. Um, <laughs> But you're missing the point here. The The whole reason why last week was a bad news story is because of the Americans. The Americans are the ones oh. who are wrong. This guy is Swedish. So not American equals not evil. So therefore, two thumbs up for Daniel Ek. OK. OTB AM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Alan Quinlan is with us. Alan, good morning to you. Morning, lads. How are you? Uh, I've been saying this for months and months and months and years and years and years. I think a European Super League for rugby is exactly the way to go. 32 teams... Uh, own local conferences, plenty of derbies, plenty of big games, scrap everything else, let's go. Who says no? <laughs> I don't know. Nobody says no, but we have a European competition that's working pretty well uh, as it stands, but um, you want to bring in more teams to, do you? Well, I mean, if you can add those South African teams into uh, a 32-team season, that would be amazing. 
Well, you've, you've, we've an ex expanded one this year, 24. So bringing four more in is 28. So we could find four more, Jar, to get to 32. But uh, we might bring in the New Zealanders and Australians as well and have a global global competition. But uh, who knows? Um, with the Rainbow Cup started at the weekend, and uh, I was pleasantly surprised at how the games went and the type of rugby we saw. To be honest. Well, let's start with the the Munster game. Um, it's it's difficult to know what this means from a long term perspective, and it might just mean that they won that game, and and there's no long term repercussions for either team. But it might it might not. Who knows? The psychological barrier that Munster had against Leinster won't be there the next time. We won't be able to say it's six in a row since Munster have managed to beat this Leinster team. How important was that? Really important. I think that. Uh... I think it was more important that he won comprehensively. I suppose first and foremost to win the game, but if they were kind of on a hiding to nothing, if they won the game by a narrow margin, um, I think they still would have been criticised, which is could be unfair. But given the teams that were selected, um, I see there was a bit of criticism kind of when the teams were announced on Friday that Munster kind of went full strength and they weren't playing some of the the young players, but there was a couple of them injured. Thomas Ahern was injured. Um, it would have been nice to see him involved but he wasn't available. Um, uh, I, I think there was a, there needed to be a desperation. Munster needed to stop this rot. They've played five times in eight months now and Leinster won you know, all of those games for the weekend. So I think it was just really important psychologically to get a result. And, you know, I think you look at, even look at the reaction, the team that Leinster selected, and I think it's very understandable given where they're going to be this weekend against La Rochelle and what's what's the most important thing for them. Um, they have a lot of strength and depth, I think. Um, and coupled with the fact that Munster just had a desperation and an aggression about them at the weekend, that they just had to get a result no matter what. It was unthinkable that Munster would lose that game. I think there would have been serious ramifications would have come out after that if that happened. But look... Um, you know, I think there's a lot of regret in the players after the Pro 14 final. Um, and, you know, sometimes it is that just, it's it's what's going on in your head. It's the psychological uh, approach. It's um, having that real fear. And some of that was, was diluted, I suppose, with the, you know, lots of people saying that, that Munster would win that Pro 14. But that's a couple of weeks back. So, look, at the end of the day, I think they just have to st stop the rot, really, win a match against Leinster, and just move on and I put them in a very strong position now if they win their next four stroke five games we don't know what how many games they're going to have we know there's three three rounds and then there's two other games that Munster themselves know have con been confirmed um it looks like you know they were supposed to play the Stormers in round six which would have been the sixth game so I don't know we still don't know what's what's going to happen is it going to be five games or six games and then a final um, but you think beating the the strongest team in it, albeit with their a weak inside, they're in a very strong position now to maybe maybe go to a final. It does paint the last couple of weeks in a, a slightly different light, Alan, doesn't it? Because I think there was real regret after the two lose game because Munster were so good in that game, where you kind of felt that against weaker opposition they might have got to the next round of Europe and if they put in that performance against Leinster they might have won the Pro 14 so there was a bit of confusion as to where Munster really were what was the, the true Munster so winning on Saturday probably moves the argument towards the fact that actually that performance against Toulouse was closer to, to what we do expect from Munster Yeah, the, look there's still there's still lots of issues as regards ball retention and mistakes from both sides um, the conditions are really good uh, I think there was a lot of turnovers a lot of knock-ons um, it was very competitive. But, yeah, I think the glass is more half full with Munster and there, there's definitely potential to get better. I think their attack needs to, you know, be expanded a little bit more, um, for sure. And and in the way they play and have kind of more options, uh, particularly during the season when there's weather conditions, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I would like to see the back three get more more ball in open field and stuff like that. But, there's there's definitely plenty of positives there that they can take away. And as I said, on you know, it's my biggest fear on Friday or before this game would have been you know a, a poor performance, um, 
and losing the game again, the, you know, it, it kind of adds more pressure onto the whole environment there. And and from a psychological point of view, it's very important to get a result. So they're the next they're the next strongest team to Leinster in in, in Ireland, and they're probably in the top four or five in Europe. Um, and as you said, Toulouse were. You know they're a fantastic side and they're potential winners of this competition. I think they will be in a final. Um, small margins in that game for Munster, and it could have been different. I think the one that lingers probably is the Leinster one because they didn't play at all. I think they played very well, and, and at times against Toulouse and showed their potential. But they have to add to that, and this is a competition now that they can, they can finish on a high and they can, hopefully, get a trophy because you know people can downgrade the the. The Rainbow Cup, and you know, it's it doesn't excite everybody, um, and we're all kind of skeptical about where it'll go. But for them, if they can get a, their hands on a trophy and and build something in the next six six to eight weeks and finish on a high, it'd be a real positive for them. You know, particularly going into pre-season and you know, trying to integrate integrate some more young players into the group and and start. Um, you know, with, with with optimism next year is again, you know, and get RG Snyman back and Thomas Ahern and you know some of the younger players that that we've been talking about all year and uh, get them into the group and and see where it takes them. What's your instinct on whether or not the whole coaching ticket will be back next year? At the moment, do you feel like we will still have the 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 the, the whole ticket intact? Um. Yeah, well, I'm I'm not hearing any, anything different, and I think um, I w- I would be of the opinion that you know they're they should stay intact. Um, I think they have to figure it out themselves where they're going. Um, at the end of last season, or even at the the conclusion of the season, kind of which immediately overlapped into a new season last September. Um, I think they finished on a, a negative there and that loss to, to Leinster in the in the and probably the manner of the performance again. Um and there was a fair bit of optimism with Dialinde and, and Snayman coming in and, and like I say, some some new young players who would energize the group a bit more and, and stake a claim for positions. Um we've seen a transition in the way they've played this year and we've seen some positive glimpses of of more expansion in the attack and the overall ta- attack when they when they get into phase wow. play and stuff like that and you know attack from a, more of an, an expansive approach from forwards as well trying to run better lines giving little offloads um not just one out runners that we saw a lot and kicking the ball i still think of course there's you know the accuracy of the kicks at times need to be better all teams do kick a lot um so I think I think they will stay intact and with round three Larkham, um, they're very, very experienced coaches who've been working with a lot of a lot of big teams in the last number of years. They were a great coup for Munster. But of I do think that, you know, for next season we've got a they've got a windy couple of these big matches and and you know, getting to semi-finals and finals is fine, but I think they've got a. There, there will be a real need to get a trophy next year. It's difficult for Johan Van Graan now because he's going into his last year, and there'll be uncertainty around uh, whether his contract is extended or not. But at the moment, I think, um, I think it's a collective effort that you know they they really need to make sure that there's there's more game plans in the bag next year, and and that's stuff they've been trying to develop this year. Um, sometimes it's down to personnel, sometimes it's down to coaching, but I think they deserve another crack at it at the start of next season, given that they're all going to be under contract and we don't see coaches get sacked in 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 in, in rugby here. Um, I think they do deserve another crack at it, and I'd be optimistic that they can take that next step up. Um, fans want to see it. I think there is a frustration in 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 Munster. That they haven't won a trophy in ten years, and then your biggest rivals are are, are setting the bar pretty high, and it's difficult chasing them down given the playing numbers and and all that kind of stuff, and uh, the way they've produced some incredible players in the last four or five years who've gone on straight. Some of them have jumped straight into the national side. So um, once there's a big club and there's a demand to try and win, and that pressure will will, will always be there. Um, so I think they will stay intact. 
I, look, I, I'm excited by what they're going to do next season with a fully fit, fingers crossed, Carberry there, as well as all of the other stuff. It's like they finally have their first choice out half and uh, a bunch of players are playing well. The investments that they've made will finally all come to fruition at the same time. So you'll see Dialende fully settled. You'll see Snyman back fit. There's more depth in the second row coming, which all of a sudden means that the bench is better. It just... I, I, y y trying to overturn a, a dynasty-type team like Leinster requires long-term planning and vision and another change in the coaching ticket I think is completely the wrong thing to do. So I really hope that yeah, they are I back think next that, year. Ger, I think to have good players, I do think they need to develop the way they play more and, and execute more. Um, and I think there's a lot of... Uh, Are there not signs of that, time. though? Do you not see... Do you not, yeah, you know, no, no, like... definitely. That's what I'm saying. But I need. To, I think they need to, to really be ambitious now and, and take that to the next level and really, you know, be a team that can play off the cuff rugby as well and, and, and move the ball and, and just a bit more freedom and attack. I think, look, under Rassi, I think the, you know, it was probably a seed set of uh, pressure, kicking game, uh, directness, um, holding on to the ball, trying to use your physicality um, to, to beat teams, all that kind of stuff um, will get you so far. But you need that little bit of finesse. And I think they realise that now, and I think they are trying to be more expansive. Um, it's hard to change habits um, straight away, but I think there is a need for that to happen. And look, if, if they need to see that themselves, I'm sure they do see it. And I think, you know, we've seen plenty of that this year. You know, I think... I thought the Toulouse you know, game the, you were seeing bits, but I even think just... Yeah, in, in, definitely. Uh, Clermont as well, you know, the game away from home, I thought the way they attacked after the, the, the shock of, of being well behind after 20 minutes was brilliant. And that's something they probably weren't able to do before. So there's plenty of ability there, but they've just got to build on that now and make sure that they become more consistent in that. And they're not... Whether they like it or not, you know, whether they're not labelled, and this la they need to change the label themselves of a side that are pretty direct and kick a lot. And um, of course, you need to kick lots in, 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 in matches, given weather conditions, all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, that's the continuous improvement that's needed in, in the attack. Do you want to see Carberry going a summer tour at Ireland this year? Yeah, of course. I think, look, he's... he's um, I expected him to kind of hit the ground running, which is unfair, um, you know. And I think he's he's you know when you come back, Gerald, like, our own, like you like he didn't and had a few Pro 14 games, eased his way back in, and then suddenly you're 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 into uh, Leinster and Toulouse. It's it's very difficult. There were always games that Munster were potentially going to lose, and um, there wasn't you know on paper they were going to be very very difficult games for any side. And um, they didn't work out great for him. I think we've seen we seen saw glimpses against Toulouse of his his ability, his natural ability, and that freedom. So he is vital to him. And you know, to be out for fourteen months, um, it is a bit unfair to expect someone to come back and hit the ground running. So I would love to see him go on a summer tour. And I think, you know, he if he gets the right quality ball and gets his confidence back up and gets his body in shape, and it takes time. Um, it would be nice to see him go on tour because I think he's, you know, his talent is, is undoubted. Let's talk a little bit about uh, La Rochelle against Leinster. Obviously, La Rochelle, that coaching ticket is breaking up. We know what's happening. Um, John O'Gibbs is going to Claremont, but uh, obviously it'd be amazing for him to sign off. And it um, seems like that's a very well-bonded team and a well-bonded coaching ticket from the outside anyway. Um, you can never know exactly what's going on. But... There's a lot of motivation there for, for La Rochelle. The quality of rugby they're playing is excellent. The strength and depth they have is... Uh, and, and the type of game they play as well is the type of game that could easily cause Leinster difficulties. Leinster are favourites with the bookmakers, and I'm very uncomfortable with that, I have to say, this weekend. I think this is essentially a 50-50 game. Um, it is, yeah. I think... Um they're a very strong, powerful side, La Rochelle. I think, can they keep that intensity going for 80 minutes, which we know Leinster, um, that's that's kind of the template, and that's the level they're at when they get to these these the, the stage, this stage of Europe. Um, it's a very difficult game for them. And it obviously has the subplots of John O'Gibbs and Ronan O'Gara 
um, added added kind of excitement for 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 people on the outside. Um, they'll be very focused, I think, and they'll be fresh and well rested, confident of what they did in in um, in Exeter. Um, and it, it it is a factor. There is no doubt about it. If you're going to the to, to France to play play them with no crowd, it takes away that home advantage a little bit. So. Um, Leinster being favourites is is very understandable, and I think that that I that's where the game. I think overall, I think the game is 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 about that intensity over eighty minutes, and can La Rochelle kind of keep that that level very high? I think Will Skelton would be someone that um, you know obviously played against Leinster many times and would have would have been central to that defeat that they had in two thousand nineteen and in Newcastle. Where they beat they beat Leinster and you know he was the colossus that day, and um, defensively the way he tackled guys back over the game line and and stopped Leinster at source. So I, I would be amazed if if Rog wasn't having chats with him and they weren't looking back at some of that stuff. But it's easy watching that and uh, you've got to go out and do it and deliver and have a work ethic and a desire for for eighty minutes and and Rog and John Gibson know that themselves. So um, they're a very dangerous side. Who have really good ringer, wingers? Who Raymond Rule is is a fantastic player, a great finisher. A body in the centre can be just incredible, devastating at the breakdown. Great ball carrier as well. Uh, Ehia West is is a concern for 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 La Rochelle whether he plays or not. I think they they have a problem at all half. Um, so it's a, it's an intriguing game. It's uh, but you just think Leinster, as I said, just a fly be favourites given. The experience they have and the way they played in that and that quarter final over in Exeter. What are the are there any implications for the way Leinster played on Saturday night for the game next weekend, or do you just immediately consign that to the dustbin and go? It was irrelevant in the context of this game this weekend. The, my only concern would be that um, they have one game played in about four or five weeks. Leinster's first team. Um, that that that's the concern. So they didn't play too long. They played Exeter, um, no games last, last week. Then um, they play second stroke, third st- stroke team this week. Um, if Leinster lose the game, that's that could be a conversation to be had. But there's no reason to to believe that it will affect them in a negative way. I think. Um, there's plenty of quality there, and and they've shown us that they can just turn that switch on and and get to a level that's uh, that that gets the job done. I'm sure they'll have a lot of, um, and I think part of the thinking last week would have been um, take away the team that's going to play against La Rochelle and prepare them. I'd be amazed if they weren't kind of working on stuff last week as a group. Um, they'd be very very fresh going into the game. They'll be obviously hoping Johnny Sexton is back. Caelan Doris would have been huge for him if he was back, but um, obviously him picking up the calf injury before the game um, may may not put him back in, in, in his starting position. But I don't think that's an issue because their back row have been fantastic. So it just depends where whether you know if 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 La Rochelle start the game well and, and get into a good position and get their confidence up and and Leinster then, you know, it's that spark that they, we know they have um, and it's for them not expecting it to happen. They've got to make it happen. So they'll be very fresh, but sometimes that little bit of match practice may be a factor and and we'll, we'll, we'll see next week. As I said, if La Rochelle win the game, maybe it's something that a conversation might be had about that situation. Okay, the uh, Connacht Ulster game on uh, Friday night was one of those games where Neil Tracy was saying a little bit earlier on Ulster uh, were leading the game. They were deep in Connacht territory. It looked like the game was over, and then Connacht managed to go the length of the field and use a captain's challenge and score a try to win the match. It's the type of thing that would have happened to Connacht uh, over the last number of years since since Pat Lamb left, essentially. But under Andy Friend, that team has developed an identity and uh, uh, a relentlessness and a resilience that you really have to think. Something it feels like something's brewing in Connacht, and they're in as good a position as they've been since Pat Lamb uh, actually won the the league for them. Yeah, it was a brilliant game. First and foremost, I thought um, their character and the reaction to 
to the try that they conceded with with when Michael Lowry makes the break and puts Lens Ulster back in front again. Um, I thought El Ulster probably looked a better side in the first half. Um, you just had a sense that they it would they would get the result and and win, and uh, it would go according to the script. But the one thing about Connacht is to say under Andy Friend is they they just have the way they played and the pace they played the game at and um, their attitude around attack is just. But they've got to play like that, Jer. You know they've got to play like that, and I think that's that's why he's uh, you know Andy. They can't simply out muscle. It's it's probably against what what he would do anyway, and believe in uh, out muscle a team up front and try and you know kick the ball a lot. They want to play, and I thought there was twenty minutes in the second half there where I was in awe at the tempo, the pace, the the energy, the commitment of the breakdown, and uh, the relentlessness of Connacht, which was incredibly impressive and. They got the tries. They put themselves in, in front. Caelan Blade was, was sensational. Um, it was great to see Papali coming on, um, give him a real focal point in attack, uh, made some great breaks, big carries, big hits. And uh, just the reaction at the end, I think I was skeptical enough about the captain's challenge, how all that stuff would work, would it slow games down, but it was a, a perfectly legit, legitimate challenge at the end where, where the ball was stripped by Michael Lowry from... Um, um, at, right at the end of the game, they got the penalty, they kicked to the corner, and then they get the winning try. It's just sensational, I think. Um, it was brilliant to see, and the excitement, and they deserved it. It wasn't one that they kind of stole. Um, I think their physicality in the second half was was incredibly impressive, and uh, it was a brilliant win for them. Uh, brilliant win as well in terms of the actual result. Less so maybe about the performance from uh, the Ireland game against Italy in the final game of the Six Nations. Um, I know rugby is absolutely in love with the whole notion of let's get the performance first and the result will look after itself. That wasn't really the case here. That team desperately needed a win for all sorts of reasons. Uh, not least is the fact that they can't allow Italy to suddenly think that they're equals in this because World Cup qualification, looming large and points and all that kind of stuff. A win was all they needed to do and they did it. And, you know, we had Stacey on earlier on and she was saying the best part about this is our performance will improve. So um, it wasn't a great game. The the quality, the, the pressure seemed to get to both teams in terms of uh, handing errors and knock-ons and all that kind of stuff. But that, I guess, in a way, even when you're playing bad, getting the results, that's the hallmark of a team who's learning and evolving. I think they can take a lot out of the tournament. Obviously, if we're being critical and and going down to the nuts and bolts of the accuracy and the execution, you can find loads, loads of faults. But um, a bit like Munster trying to win in the in 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 the RDS, this this was a must-win game to lay down a marker for those World Cup qualifiers. Um, no matter how many training sessions you have, Darren, that's that's the point I was kind of making about the Leinster. Uh, having one game with the first team in four or five weeks going into this La Rochelle game, sometimes you can get a bit rusty and nothing beats matches. And I think um, to have 20 training sessions before the tournament for the women, um, of course you can work on things and you can put systems in place and, and things you want to do, but you're not allowed to do that all the time when you go out in the field and you've got to earn the right to do it um, with you know the opposition trying to smash you and and unsettling and stuff like that. So, um, mixed bag throughout the tournament with performances, but to win two out of three is exactly um, what they needed. They need to finish next in line to to France and and, and England, and I think that's the best they could hope for. Um, of course, they would have loved to be more competitive on the scoreline closer against France, and there was optimism going into that game. So they would have learned a lot, but I think. The commitments and the desire and the effort level um, was very, very impressive throughout the whole tournament. And I think they deserve a lot of credit for, you know, dealing with the the big disappointments and frustration after that France game. And defensively, they were so good on Saturday um, against a very physical um, Italian side, but lots of turnovers, lots of mistakes from both sides. And sometimes that's down to pressure and the competitiveness. But Overall, I think they can be very, very pleased. There's a few girls who've been integrated from the seven series. Um, Adam Griggs will hope to keep them for World Cup qualifiers. I think we don't know when they're happening. 
it may, it's been touted as September. But um, overall, I think they can be very, very pleased. And you saw the excitement yeah. and the happiness at the end of the game, which was lovely to see, I think. I felt so sorry from the week before because they were the architects of their own downfall a lot of the time with the scores that France, France punished them for. Um, but, you know, to see the, what it meant to him on Saturday was really, really pleasing. And uh, it was a great way for him to finish. There's loads, of course, as Stacey Flood was saying, yeah, that they can work on and get better on. But it's very unfair and, and it's hard when you're, you're trying to get better when you've no matches. You know, they hadn't played since October. So to get up to that next level, um, you need matches. And that's, that's a the frustrating point. thing for them now. They don't have matches. They don't know when they play again. Yeah. Um, and even, so even it's the, difficult. So even the club game that always asking about too. So, yeah. No, it's, yeah, no certainty around that. But look, a great way for them to finish. And look, who cares about the performance? At this stage, it was about the results. And they did that job. Uh, won by 20 points on Saturday. Uh, and that was great to see. Alan, good stuff. Thanks a minute for joining us. Cheers. Cheers, lads. Alan Quinlan giving us his thoughts there on uh, several of the big stories from the week and obviously we'll hear from Alan again on Friday ahead of, Ar ahead of Ireland, ahead of Leinster against La Rochelle in the semi-final of the European Champions Cup again, of course you can hear live here on Off the Ball. Now it is 16 minutes past nine. You're watching OTB AM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Plenty still to come this hour on OTB AM. We're back after these with the Gillette performance rankings. OTB AM This is OTB Sports Radio. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna automower. Automower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. Have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Automower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie Check out the Boyle Sports app today for details on which football match is getting the no-lose treatment this week. Plus, browse through dozens of new player markets, all powered by Opta. Shots on target, left foot, right foot, headed goals, assists and more. See the Boyle Sports app for full T's and C's. Boyle Sports. This is betting. Gamble responsibly. See gamblingcare.ie 18+. plus. Off the ball. I scored a goal in some kind of um, celebrity thing that I managed to get invited to. But Bez from the Happy Mondays was a goal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. I was like, he didn't put up much resistance, but he had the decency. He's a good goal, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the highlights of my life. Like, he was watching the match. He said it being in goal. It's like, of oh, course, that was a good goal, Tom. <laughs> Off the ball. Weeknights from 7 and weekends from 1. This is OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. OTB AM. With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. 18 minutes past 9 this morning here on OTB AM. You're uh, welcome to Off the Ball's uh, Sports Breakfast Show. It's time for the Gillette Performance Rankings. You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on their second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is was just lack that intensity. All right, every Monday morning here on OTBM, we bring you the Gillette Performance Rankings. You can get your chance to have your say over the course of the weekend. Let us know who you think should make the cut. If you enter, you're in the mix to win a Gillette starter pack. Owen, we go from red to amber to green. Who's in red this week? In red is Tottenham Hotspur. This is where we're going to start today and I don't know, D Daniel Levy, it's kind of like he's played a game of Texas Hold'em over the last week and he had an okay set of cards to start things off and he's just folded. The bet, like the bet wasn't that big, didn't have to put much into the pot and he folded. That's kind of what it feels like. He didn't, he didn't have a look. All he had to do was just have a look what would have happened with Jose in the dugout yesterday. They probably would have lost. He probably wouldn't have won the hand. But it wouldn't have cost him that much to actually just have a look. And but, now we're sitting here and we'll never know what would have happened if Jose was sitting there yesterday. Well, what it shows is the complete lack of intention to win trophies. There's no, there's no argument that the hierarchy of a club is interested in winning trophies when you take your manager out the week before the cup final and you put an inexperienced 29-year-old in charge 
of the side. This is nothing against the stand-in manager, absolutely nothing against him. But that decision clearly looks like it was made on the basis of money as opposed to outcome. And there was an opportunity for Spurs to win their first trophy since the last time they won this trophy. And to remove that opportunity, which is essentially what you've done, suggests that you're making those decisions purely on the basis of finance. Unless there is some clause that he's unsackable because he's won the League Cup, in which case you've negotiated a really bad contract too. So of all of the people that needs to get grief this day, it is Daniel Levy for making that decision. Jose Mourinho as manager, as a top, as a top flight manager, his time appears to be gone. It appeared to be gone at the end of his time in charge of Manchester United. But that didn't stop Spurs from giving him a big contract and giving him the opportunity to take them into the new stadium. Maybe things might have been different in a non-COVID world. It's unlikely. It looks like the Spurs experiment ended the way the Spurs experiment was supposed to end with Jose Mourinho. But when there is an opportunity for him in a one-off game to go up against Pep and to frustrate the life out of a Manchester City side who appeared a little bit nervous at various stages in games, particularly, you know, there was... Uh, Spurs have beaten City this season under Jose Mourinho. Like, give him the chance to do this and then at the end of the season say, it hasn't worked out, you won the trophy, you get to say you won the trophy, here's the amount of money I was going to give you, maybe it's an extra million or two, I don't know, on the, on the basis of winning the trophy and that, those clauses in the contract that we now all are speculating about because of the Jamie Redknapp voice note. Who knows, it would be great if someone would come out and clarify any, any of that. But the thing is that Spurs and their, their ownership can't say that we're all about bringing trophies and glory to the club when they had an opportunity to win a trophy and they decided to go with a 29-year-old who's never managed at this level in his life before. He had one game to prepare the side and even in the pre-match, it was uh, Harry Kane, Harry's told me he's fit to play. Who's the boss? Like Harry, Harry Kane is not the boss. So you've got to make those decisions. And look, Pochettino obviously played Harry Kane unfit in the Champions League final, so I'm sure, I'm sure Jose would have played him, but maybe, maybe Jose would have taken him off when it was apparent that he wasn't fit. Or maybe Jose would have left him in reserve for the last half hour. You can give me half an hour at the end there when we're trying to break them down or for extra time and penalties because we know that that's where this is going. Mm. Like, I mean, the counter-argument to that is that you've got a manager who had been producing putrid football for the second half of the season and results weren't good. Like, there was no reason to keep him, but I'm just... I, I just think that... No reason to keep him that one week and for this one-off game where he's got a reasonable record against the guy and a reasonable record of winning trophies? Like, or, or the kid? Mm. Which like, of these two I, I, is going like, to give you the most opportunity to You obviously win. pick, pick Jose. Like, I mean, it's, Spurs are, are very much in the red here. There's no getting away from that. They're also further in the red because it looks like Julian Nagelsmann is going to go to Bayern Munich and he won't be available to go to, to Tottenham. Uh, like, there, there, it did seem uh, six months ago that there was a wealth of different options when it came to appointing a new manager. If, if he goes to Bayern Munich, then uh, I guess that top tier of, of German manager, Tuchel, having gone to Chelsea already, is, is, starts, to, starts to dwindle a little bit. Yeah, uh, Brendan Rodgers is available. Brendan Rodgers is available, but why would you leave Leicester City at the moment and the else and, is available? Uh, go to well, because Spurs are going to give him more money, and the the that Spurs stadium when it's full is going to be amazing. Uh, on the point that you made about the trophies, like that, I think illustrates a further disconnect between the players and the people who run the clubs. Because if you look at the body language of the Spurs players after the game last night, the trophy clearly matters. Son was crying after the game. Kane was pretty disappointed afterwards as well. Those are not the actions of players who were like screw the Carabao Cup. No. So it matters to them, and maybe to Daniel Levy it didn't matter as much as it did to, to the players. Also in the red <clears throat> this week, excuse me, is uh, Leeds and Manchester United. They are both in there after serving up uh, a pretty poor fare yesterday, to say the least, which is a bit of a shame because I thought the Manchester United versus Leeds game before Christmas was a brilliant game. I thought Bruno Fernandes was one of his best performances of the season. He was absolutely outstanding that night. I think it was, the, it was actually the day after the All-Ireland final, that, that last weekend before Christmas. And I think this actually kind of plays into what we heard Brian Kerr talking about earlier on, the fatigue which is completely stamping upon Bruno Fernandes' game at the moment. That is indicative throughout the entire league at the moment. I see Graham Souness pointed towards refereeing as a reason why the Premier League fair has been so poor recently. I think the fact is, like I think this is a topical conversation to have, is that the Premier League is just a competition that, unlike most big sports competitions in the world, actually takes a nosedive the later it goes in the season. 
most competitions get going the later they go in the season. The Premier League obviously just dwindles. People go hell for letter for the first few months and then come February or March. They're pretty certain about what sort of position they're going to finish in and this is what we're left with. Yes, the fatigue is important, but I think motivation and what's actually at stake is, is another big factor. What, what would fix that? Playoffs, the end. A grand final, yeah, like where we, you could like be fifty-five points behind Man City, scrape into the top eight playoffs, and uh, beat them in a one-off game at Wembley. That'd like be I, class. I, I know we kind of like facetiously put this to David Myler earlier on. This, this idea that oh, people were asking for more games, and look at what all the games have done to Manchester United versus Leeds. Like that's actually the wrong way to look at this completely. It's a different sort of games. Be, people uh, maybe have been asking for for more meaningful games, and like there would have been a knockout phase to the, to the Super League and all that. Like I mean. Maybe what we're seeing at the moment is, that, is actually a reason why UEFA shouldn't go with their new Absolutely. idea for the Champions League. Because what that is is just more group stage games. Yeah. The last 16 onwards is going to be exactly the same and that's where people really have to be on it. Um, one of the things that the Super League was going to eventually lead to was an 18-team division in the Premier League. An 18-team division in the Premier League would be better than the current 20-team. No, like you're not, you're not going to find any argument for me in this. Like that was that part of Project Big Picture as well, um, the John W. Henry's uh, Project Big Picture, which was I have forgotten about uh, uh, Project Big Picture because it too did not last very long in terms of oh this is, this is mad vision this is great it's going to be we're going to fix everything. It's like what was the what was that idea again? So uh, this has been a year for a lot of kite flying ideas of how to fix football, none of which have come through. So, like, football is just in this stasis now. There, nothing will ever change. We're locked in an endless battle of Leeds United nil, Manchester United nil, versus um, what could happen in the European Cup this week. And also, like, I, just for the record, like, I'm, I wasn't necessarily for the, the Super League by any stretch of the imagination, but there, there are a couple of threads to the argument that uh, have been quite timely. Like, the, the, the poor quality of football we saw at the weekend is one of them. The second is uh, seeing Norwich, Bournemouth and Watford coming straight back up to the Premier League next season, or like assuming that the playoffs go uh, that way, and I, I saw that meme during the rounds last week where uh, Mo chose Barney out of his pub, and Barney's behind him uh, straight away again, and it's uh, Norwich, Bournemouth, and Watford coming straight back into the Premier League, where people were like, "Don't ring fence a league." Well, next season's Premier League is going to feel awfully familiar, with the exception of Leeds United. Um, like the, so, yeah, maybe football is just locked in a, in an endless loop of the same thing, where we're all really excited by it from August through to Christmas, because Christmas we've got loads of games, and then once the Champions League takes over in February, that's it. We just forget about the, the domestic game, the English game, so to speak. If only there was the European Super League to save us all from our mystery. <laughs> uh, right, number yeah. three. Um, yeah, and speaking of European Super League, Super Competitions, uh, Ireland, as we all know, they lost the playoff to Slovakia last year, so they we're never going to have any competitive part in the Euros this year, but they were supposed to have some sort of hosting part in the Euros this year. That is not now happening. Uh, Michal Martin was on the Week in Politics yesterday and said that he thought that UEFA were out of order, quite frankly, putting that condition on countries. And this is a quote from Michal Martin. To be putting obligations on countries to force spectators in prematurely, in my view, was a wrong call by the footballing authorities and I never thought it was a realistic proposition. We need to learn from previous experiences. Let's learn solidly. We moved very well in April. I want to be at a match. I'd love nothing more than to be at a club championship match. And that may happen before the end of the summer. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. I've put him in the grand here because I think we had this conversation before, but Michal Martin and his government are very fortunate that Ireland aren't at the Euros this year. This would be a much bigger story if Ireland had got past Slovakia and then won their playoff final and then qualified for the Euros. The decision to reopen at Christmas... Like, I mean, when you compare vaccination programs between Ireland and other EU countries, Ireland obviously aren't doing too badly, but there might have been frustration on that element as well. Yeah. Had Ireland actually qualified for this thing and then all of a sudden, yeah, you're uh, playing in Seville. We uh, want to have other. a meaningful Euros, would have been what we would have been saying at Christmas, as opposed to we want to have a meaningful Christmas. Right, let's get to the Greens, because we've only got two minutes left here. First one is Munster. What a, what a victory. What a It'll victory. It'll be a big night in the Glen tonight. 
there are certainly will. Uh, th these uh, moments will be remembered uh, for as long as anybody will live in Munster, beating Leinster and ending that six-game run. In fairness, this will be used nicely as, uh, as a narrative arc or the start of a narrative arc of Munster actually beat Leinster in a meaningful game next season. Say if it's the same Pro 14 final, people will be like, well, remember the Rainbow Cup? Yeah. That's when it started. And to be honest with you, there might actually be stock in that argument. Or, or if they don't do it, it'll be like, it was only the Rainbow Cup. That's the thing. Yeah. They, we'll, we'll retrofit this narrative. They played well in that game, and it's important that they continue to play well next season. What's more important is that their best players stay fit and that we get to see them play together. And that's where you'll begin to see the betting in of all of the other game plans that they have and that they're unfolding. Number one, Manchester City. For a four-peat. Foursome. A four-burger. What is it? <laughs> quad. Um, oh, it's I'm, not four in a row, isn't it? Quad. I don't know. Like, did anybody know that they were on for four Carabao Cups uh, in a row before uh, Pep Guardiola was like that afterwards? Um, I'm not sure I was. L Liverpool did four League Cups in a row in the 1980s, I think. So, And I think that's been glossed over a little bit, that this is did like they? this... Sort of, uh, I, I, could, I could be totally wrong, but I, maybe maybe it was three in a row. I thought I thought it was four when I was uh, quickly looking back on it. But Man City have done the four, fair play to them. They'll be going for five next season. But again, this is like Munster winning the Rainbow Cup. To be completely honest, it's Wednesday, eight o'clock, Paris Saint Germain against Manchester City. That is where it all goes. Like oh, they would yeah. give up everything. They would go for the single. Um, yeah. Like, actually, that, that was actually the kind of uh, the, the irony of the fours that the four was gone the previous week and now they're on for the three. Uh, maybe there was a bit of trolling going on. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. But yeah, all the eggs are in the PSG basket this week for Manchester City. If they can win the Champions League, then it doesn't matter how many in a row they've won in the Carabao Cup. It is all in this comp. Our audience suggestions um, here. Bobby Murphy says Alexander Seferin for referring to Agnelli as a snake. That's a junior football performance. Uh, Ian says Calvin Phillips after his performance of the weekend for Leeds nullified Fernandez. Sean Carley says Dubravka for his brilliant performance at Anfield. Stephen Carberry says VAR and Spurs in the red, Klopp in the orange and Munster slash Connacht and the AFL for having crowds back in the red. 80,000 at the um, MCG. Alan Mullen says Leo Cullen in the red after that hammering on Saturday evening. I don't think so. I don't think so, Alan. Niall says he wants Klopp in the red for, I mean, Klopp's not had the best of weeks. All of a sudden you're like, that's not great. Maybe you should just, um, just calm down a little bit. Put Gavin Coombs in green. He's a beast. Uh, put him in green for Ireland. Absolutely. Put him in green today on the uh, Gillette performance rankings as well. Munster in green says Conor Horn. Colin Lynch says Conor Murray and Damien Dialende in the green. Murray is back to his best. Did he do enough to get into the Lion squad? You know, he's a, he's a head coach who likes the stuff that you've done for him before, Warren Gatland. Very, very, very loyal. This, this is, these are the boots that he wore in New Zealand. You can see the dirt on them from it so uh, in the lines uh, right competition winner congratulations to Paula Courtney you've won our Gillette starter pack this morning Paula picked Damien Dialende for a complete performance is it Damien is that how they yes is that how, Damien I'm Dialende I'm confidently going to say that Damien Dialende for a complete performance on Saturday night that's been a long time coming that's it for this week's performance rankings OTBAM's performance rankings with Gillette yeah, a reminder, of course, OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, Star, with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Tomorrow morning from half past seven, talking Champions League with Graham Hunter. There's the tight five with Neil Tracy and much more besides as well. We're going to bring you some more reaction to the weekend sport right now. Here's Gronya McElwain and Kieran Cunningham alongside Joe on the pay-per-view. Right, let's start with the Super League coverage, Kieran. Where do you want to go? Um, I have to say, in a way, I was kind of dreading it because there's been... It's been su such a hard week. There's been so much stuff written and said already. Wonder, you know, how much appetite have you to go out again? It has been an extraordinary story. Like, I think this broke um, around 4, 4 p.m. or so, or no, afternoon, some, sometime in the afternoon last Sunday. Effectively, it's dead in the water by Wednesday night. You know, the things progress so quickly. And it's something that Jonathan North, Governor Sunday Times, touches on. Um, in regard to the reaction from players and the, the voice that they had, and he, he quotes an unnamed agent, and they had this, he said, had this stunt been pulled 20 years ago, the players wouldn't be the voice, not, nor would the coaches. The voice came from social media and 24-7 sports reporting. The players of the last generation couldn't have organised themselves in a way that was so effective. It actually made me think of the wider point on social media that, you know, sometimes people say, you know, what it would have been like if Saipan, Twitter was around when Saipan was there, you know, God, God forbid that it was, but I think this was a story that, in a way, it was killed on social media. It blew up on social media and it was killed because the reaction was so overpoweringly 
overpoweringly negative against it. And it helped people to organize against it. And, you know, I haven't seen any story in a long time that took over timelines so much. You know, there just seemed to be nothing except people's reaction. And there was very few voices in favor of it. And I think straight away, you could see they were really up against it because the opposition, it was clear the opposition that was out there. Yeah, very true. Jonathan Northcroft's uh, piece has lots of interesting background info. And I guess that's the nice thing about a journalist who's had all week to work on this story is they're able to dig into their contacts and find out some things that happened. So, for instance, uh, Mike Gordon, he's the FSG president. He phoned Jordan Henderson on Monday and he said two things. He said, we are absolutely committed to taking the club into the Super League. However, you are free to speak your mind. He said, we're doing this in principle and you have to speak to your principles. So it was interesting. Henderson was told there was no issue with you or the playing staff speaking out. We can presume uh, Klopp was told the same thing. Seems uh, playing and coaching staffs were not told until the weekend this broke. Uh, one reason keep, for keeping them in the dark, says Northcroft, was plausible deniability. In which, they, 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 in which case they could, like Klopp did on Monday, turn to fans and say, nothing to do with us. We didn't know a thing about it. Uh, there's a PR person uh, who was in the uh, Zoom call between the Big 12 on the Friday and they were talking about their communications strategy and somebody described it as a sketch on the back of a fag packet strategy. Is, uh, <laughs> and that seems about right. And then uh, one other point as well is that Jordan Henderson... So at 9 o'clock Tuesday, all the Liverpool players posted the same social media post. We don't like it, we don't want it to happen. Their action was led by Henderson. They had wanted to go earlier in the day, but he wanted to wait until everybody came back to him on WhatsApp. But interestingly, he had also been onto the Premier League captains as well via that same WhatsApp group that had been set up during the COVID lockdown when they were talking about Project Restart and the NHS Together movement and everything. And it turns out all the Premier League captains were set to speak out on Wednesday. Now, obviously, this thing fell by the wayside Tuesday evening, but uh, Henderson, it seemed, had taken charge there as well. And the captains were ready to come out. So really interesting stuff there in Northcroft's piece in the Sunday Times. Grania, what caught your eye? Yeah, I, I think on that, Joe, and the, I mean, this story was unbelievable. I don't remember watching a game for so much and actually just waiting to hear what Jurgen Klopp had to say before the, the Leeds-Liverpool game last Monday. Um, and, and what's interesting, like this has been from what we're reading and hearing has been in the making for the last three years, the Super League yet how poorly it was executed. Like, it's actually unbelievable that you would actually go ahead and do something like this without really consulting your players and your management teams and then just put everyone out there and go off you go. I, I just can't believe how badly PR exercise was done. It was interesting in that piece, I think someone that you, you referenced there, Joe, that they actually walked away from it because it was so badly organised. So you think if you're planning something for three years, you actually would execute it at, at, a, at the correct time as well. Like, not just during the day when the Premier League games are about to kick off and suddenly, my God, every TV, every broadcaster wants to find out a reaction from players and from management. But what's also in interesting as well is that, and um, Kieran just referenced it there, the whole Twitter and social media, like there's there's kind of like a shift as well, you know, definitely the fans coming out was were important, but I also think players coming out and the power that they have on social media, like in that, in that Jonathan Northcroft um, piece, which I find really good, like Marcus Rashford, he tweeted... Um, an epitaph from Sir Matt Busby about how football is about supporters and not money and it gained more than half a million likes mm. which for context here would have made it the second most popular tweet from a UK feed in 2020 so we're talking about player power here like Jordan Henderson they have the resources with that WhatsApp group that they put together that you referenced as well but when it says here as well in, in Jonathan Northcroft's piece when by midnight on Tuesday Liverpool United Arsenal and Tottenham also pulled out of the ESL it was no surprise Anyone in living in Britain in the past year, never mind worked in football, will tell you that you can never win if Rashford, Guardiola, Henderson, and Raheem Sterling, who tweeted OK bye as the ESL collapsed, are against you. Yeah. So I think it's it's opened up a real the power of social media, but just such a poor executed policy for business people that are involved in making these massive deals to actually that disconnect that you actually think we can go ahead and do this without actually having your main stakeholders about which are your players and your management teams let's face it you know they were so against it and then not even consult them like it was unbelievable it was so bizarre and such a fascinating story I, I again I can't remember the last time that I've been so captivated and you'd start listening to it at point and by, and half an hour an hour later things had changed and things like Josie Mourinho 
and getting the sack just didn't even come into the equation all week. You know, you just didn't even have time to, de to de decipher that. So lots of pieces of that, Jonathan Offgrave. Again, if you look at the Sunday Indo, Eamon Sweeney as well, and he's taken the, the stint from the fans won't stand for it. And I thought this was a really good piece too because it's kind of saying, well, what the fans are standing for at the moment. And in Premier Leagues, it's, you know, they're, they're talking about, you know, turning a blind eye or maybe not just being as as critical of some of the Premier Leagues in terms of owning it, of the regimes that they have and the guilty of human rights violations at home and connected with war crimes abroad, sports so entangled with gambling, season tickets, prices, overpriced replica kits. Um, for example, England's 2018 World Cup um, kit cost £160, was made in Bangladesh by workers paid as little as 21 pence an hour. Um, Eamon Sweeney writes, you know, just it's all about revenue um, despite the millions being lavished on wages and transfer, only five out of the 20 clubs are willing to pay their lowest pa paid staff the real living wage of £9.30 an hour, even though that would require an hourly increase of just 50 pence from the statutory minimum. And you just look at the closed shop. And, and his point as well in this piece um, was that the ESL, in kind of it is a de facto um, Super League in Europe as it is at the stands. He goes through the different teams that are comp competing. In reality, in the Premier League, 72 clubs are competing and um, 44 have never played in the Premier League and another seven haven't been there in the last 20 years. Mm. In Europe, um, in Spain, 2003, um, no clubs since then other than Real Madrid, Barcelona, Atletico Madrid have won La Liga and the same in, in, in Italy. It's Juventus, Inter Milan, AC Milan have been in power there since 2001. Bayern Munich are closing in the ninth title and PSG have won seven of the last eight league titles. So he's just making the point there that, you know, we have kind of like a European Super League as it stands and... And fans, I think, are important, but just also if, and David Walsh and his piece as well, if fans would get so riled up and so um, crusted, as they would say, ask Gaelic and Irish about the, <clears throat> about racism, we'd actually might see a very a, a very stronger result happening and, and, and our attitudes towards that. Mm. Kieran, did people did make the point, as Grainne has alluded to, that these clubs were just looking to formalise a reality which has been in existence for some time already? Yeah, without doubt. Uh, like, you can... Like Bayern Munich have been widely praised for for not getting on board with it, you know, and, and the fifty plus one rule in Germany is, is a big part of that. But you could also make the point like that Bayern are about to win, you know, a ninth Bundesliga title in a row. Whenever uh, a serious threat to them emerges, like Borussia Dortmund under Jurgen Klopp, they basically fill out the club and take the best players, like they took Lewandowski. Mm. So the status quo suits them, you know. The status quo suits a lot of clubs. So. Um, like, there's been a lot of nonsense around this. Like, I listened to Five Live yesterday after Liverpool's draw with Newcastle. And Chris Sutton was on, and Rory Smith of the New York Times. And Chris Sutton was saying, you know, going with this kind of stuff again, that this shows we don't need a Super League. This shows the Premier League is the greatest in the world. You know, that, you know, you, you, Liverpool weren't able to the reigning champions. They couldn't be hold on against Newcastle. And Rory Smith had to make the very, very valid point that you get 1-1 one, one draws in every level of the game with late equalisers against the team that dominated for most of the game and did most of the chances. You know, you can't uh, extrapolate some wider point out of that. And the reality is that um, the, 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 the teams that are, uh, the, t the six English teams that wanted to break away, if, if a team outside that in the next 30 years wins the league, I'd be very surprised. I think the only option is possibly Leicester City. Mm -hmm. I can't see anybody else winning it. Like the, the reality is those are the teams with the money and the power. And uh, I think it's um, somebody talks about being in Ethiopia. Uh, uh, Jonathan Wilson. The, Jonathan Wilson. Yeah, and about how twenty percent of the village he was in were watching the Premier League, and that goes into the sales of Premier League. The Premier League sell, has TV deals worldwide because of Liverpool and Manchester United. It's not even City or Chelsea at the moment because they have, they've been their success is more recent. They haven't built up a global power base yet. Mm. But if you take Liverpool and United out of those TV deals, how many people would want to buy them? And even th so, that's the way where those clubs are coming from. That's night Sheffield United against Brighton was shown on TV. I guarantee you, the figures with that, for that would have been dismal. Like most people who buy the Sky packages, the BT packages, etc., they're only buying to watch the big clubs. And I think this is what these clubs were looking at, and it will be the future TV deals, that you will buy a deal to watch Liverpool games or United games or City games or whatever, that the general package, like most people, I know Burnley keep being thrown into it for some reason, most people don't want to watch Burnley games other than Burnley fans. That's, that's reality. So uh, 
you know, Bill Kenwright is an interest, like this Bill Kenwright in the, in the mail, he's an interview that Oliver Holt, Holt and he's one of the old style fan owners, you know, and he goes into his history of being a fan, you know, and it, there's a lot of nice stories. Like you get on a train for London and people will be coming on at different places, like from Crew or Rochdale or Bury or Gillingham. And they were all going to watch those teams, you know, and that was, that's what he grew up with. But I also think like, even if they'd done it in a different way, if they had Super League Two with relegation uh, or promotion and relegation to the top tier European Super League, mm. and they'd approached teams like Everton and Leicester and West Ham, would they have turned them down? I'm not so sure they would have. Mm. Like, I think that a lot of this is, disgruntlement have been excluded. If they were told you have a way into the Super League, would these clubs have been so dead against it? Well, Bill swears they would have said no, so... <laughs> yeah. Bill might be unusual. I'm not so sure about some of the other owners. You know, you look at Leicester City's owners. They have said no. I'm not yeah. so sure. Yeah, I'm not so sure either. Uh, you mentioned Jonathan Wilson's piece there. It's, uh, I think, a really good overview of what's been going on here. So he says, this is in The Observer, it's also in The Sunday Independent, uh, conditions that provoke the attempted coup are not gone. So he says this week it was the, um, you know, potentially the biggest rupture in European football since 1885 when professionalism came in. And he says, having come so close, it feels remarkable it's taken so long for a model that is accepted elsewhere, crickets, IPL, rugby union, super rugby, all major US sports, etc., to become a serious possibility in English football. Uh, and he says, of the super clubs, they're in two factions, and this gets to the heart of the point. They're in two factions. There are those whose wealth is derived predominantly from football, and there are those who might be termed the Petro Clubs, whose external resources mean they can easily ride out a couple of disappointing years on the pitch. Uh, he says the Super League feels the natural consequence of neoliberal economics that looks at football as purely a generator of revenue and ignores its social function. And he talks about various things. You know, in uh, 1981, the English FA lifted a ban on director remuneration. 1992, the Premier League, that solidated the elite. Talks about things like the 1987-88 European Cup, Napoli versus Real Madrid, the champions of Italy against Spain in the very first round. Club executives saw this as an unconscionable reduction in the number of marketable games, hence the change in the Champions League. But he does say things like English football, league attendances are higher than they've been at any stage, really, over the last 60-odd years. However, the match-going fans, who 30 years ago were so important to clubs' finances, are now uh, no longer the primary source of revenue. It's about globalisation and the point you make about Ethiopia watching these games. He concludes by saying, if you're, uh, like Florentino Perez is, if you're declaring an economic crisis at a time when football is watched by more people than ever before, maybe the issue is less the football and more the business. This is the paradox. By the logic of the market, shouldn't the clubs who cannot thrive in such circumstances be allowed to fail? Has Florentino Perez ever considered just not spending so much? And that is the point here, Grania, that the more traditionally funded clubs are looking at PSG and Man City and I suppose to an extent Chelsea and they can't keep up. They have to strike now because they can't keep up. Well, they, they can't afford to buy these players. Like, the, the wages are just astronomical that some of these clubs are able to play players. But I just want to just, and just continue in that, and yeah. that vein off that, that he just mentioned, and just to come in as well, just on, on Graeme Sooney's, just Sooney's had a piece just underneath um, Jonathan Northcroft's in the Sunday Times. And I just find it interesting in that, you know, I, I wonder in 20 years' time will people look back and go, that was a missed opportunity um, because, you know, we're living it at the moment and people at the time when the Premier League was changing or when Sky Sports got involved, people were outraged about that too, going, gosh, are, you know, are we selling our soul, etc. But Graham Soonies is talking about trust in the game and, and just interesting in that, you know, he's talking about tra the traditional fan in that, you know, um, they, um, they fail to grasp that the guy who buys a season ticket or girl probably sits in the same seat his dad did and beyond that possibly his grandfather too. They didn't understand that our clubs are institutions to supporters and not just another exporting franchise. But I think the data, as, as Kieran was saying, like we're seeing 20% of people watching this in Ethiopia. It's becoming a global fan. And I heard different reports on, on your program and during the week as well. It was, you know, if Anfield was empty tomorrow morning you would have people coming from all around the world that want to go and experience that time for the Gillette game. performance record. so I think it's getting more you know that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance soon as also mentions as well that the motive for the Super League as we all know was money and new markets Europe has less than 10% of the world's population Asia has 60% 
and that's what they're targeting. So, you know, the fans, the traditional fans are really important, but I think with that disconnect with owners coming in that aren't English, that aren't that, that, that possibly aren't involved in the club because of wanting it to football or there because of money. They don't see that connect as important as mm. it would have been years ago. So that um, there's a disconnect there as well and a value chain that's changing as well on what a traditional fan is. So you have fans that want to be fit to get um, Haaland and, and Mbappe, but who's going to pay for them? Like, where's that money going to come from? And they want owners that have lots and lots of money. Mm. And if they have clubs that are just run very sparsely as for example Arsenal under Wenger might have been very very you know they were there or there about they were never going to win anything but they stayed in the Premier League but fans got frustrated because they want to win cups they want to win titles so who is going to pay this money for them and that comes from broadcast rights that comes from wealthy owners and that's what we're seeing so you're seeing these wealthy owners going well hang on a second we we want a Super League we want to make money because the game is changing but that's a different, you have to flip that in your head. Are we paying too much money to all these players? You know, if everyone wants a fair, um, equitable society and a rest retribution of success, well, then you basically have to um, redistribute the funds and how are we going to do that? So I think that's an interesting topic that needs to be explored as well. And when it comes to it, do fans really want that? Do they want to be staying in the Premier League and just be there or thereabouts? Or do they actually want to push for it? Um, and I know everyone's talking about Leicester and that was a brilliant, brilliant performance by Leicester. But how many teams realistically are going to do that over the next 10 years? Mm. There is um, one very good piece by John Carlin, I thought, on Florentino Perez. And he makes the point, you know, Perez has been accused of being deluded and tone deaf. And that's certainly true. But Carlin does point out this guy's no fool. In many ways, he's the most impressive of all the club chairmen. And I think that is very true. I'm going to come to a Neil Francis piece in a minute because he just uh, points out how rugby really needs to watch what's going on in a big way. But a point I'd probably disagree with Neil. He's talking about how smart a lot of these people are at the top of these clubs. And I'm not sure that fully stands up to certain scrutiny. You've got a lot of not self-made men here. You've got the Glazers, who are just heirs to a fortune. You've got Stan Kroenke, who married into his fortune. Sheikh Mansour, I don't think we could describe him as a self-made man. Agnelli, again, just inherited his family's situation. Like, the, you know, of the 12, pretty quickly, you're getting into people who might mistake their good fortune in life for a great intelligence and based on the effort to execute this thing, there are probably legitimate questions about the intelligence in places. But Perez is no fool. And like this guy has, has done a remarkable thing. He is absolutely self-made. He has got into, well, he's a qualified engineer, but his construction uh, conglomerate, it turns over 100 million euros a day. 100 million a day. Employs 200,000 people in 60 countries. He's built tunnels, bridges, roads, railway lines right across the world. Uh, Carlin says his blind spot is Real Madrid. He's been a fan since he was five. Uh, he absolutely adores this club. Everything I do, he said, is for the good of football. Carlin says, translation, everything I do is for the good of Real Madrid. So he has tunnel vision. And he says, Carlin, that is, the author, he says, the word greed has been thrown at Perez. He said, that may not quite be accurate here. This is about survival. He says survival is the better word. He says the income gap between the Premier League and La Liga yawns wider with every season. The quality gap too. Uh, Madrid, you know, to compete is only going to become more difficult over time. It's the same for Juan Laporta at Barcelona. So he uh, writes, Carlin, the six English clubs caved in at the first sign of resistance because for them, the project was indeed about winning a few more dollars, not the fear of financial ruin. And he says of uh, Perez, he's humbled and humiliated and obliged to endure the sneers. But the point is, Kieran, he's coming back. I mean, he's, he's <laughs> when when the, on the front page of the Sunday Independent, where he's going on about um, binding contracts and you could say making a holy show of himself. It's out of desperation. This isn't a, like the greed point applies to some. I'm not sure it actually does apply to Perez here. No, because it reflects Real Madrid's situation with their massive debts. And this was his way. This was, I think he, saw, he sees this as the only way out of that. And, uh, you know, it is telling, like, you look at the fan protests in England. There haven't been anything like fan protests, uh, similar fan protests in Spain, yeah. you know, because uh, the, the Barcelona and Real Madrid fans recognise that the clubs are in big trouble. Like, I think it's interesting when you look at England, that, like the clubs that were said to be a bit more wary but get into this and who were quickest to turn were Chelsea and Manchester City. But I think that's a reflection of the money they've got behind them. Like no club has ever spent 
on the scale of City over the last 10 years. Last summer alone, Chelsea spent nearly 300 million euro. So they have massive money, you know, behind the worst. <clears throat> the likes of Liverpool don't, you know. Liverpool, you know, uh, their last four transfer windows have been net spend of 30 million. Their wage, their wage bill, though, was massive. It's bigger than Bayern Munich's. And they need, uh, like, they're in a bind now because if they miss out in Champions League football, combined with the hit they've taken of COVID. But a lot of, uh, a lot of clubs that were going on to this weren't coming from the same base. Some are looking at it as was something they'd like to do, but others are, are doing it out of desperation. And I think also out of weariness that they, they think they pay for the rest, that they're the people who finance the TV deals for the rest, etc. And also, I think you're going to see a reaction against UEFA and FIFA, that they're being seen in some way as a saviour of the game over this. But FIFA makes $6 billion from the World Cup. Mm. And how much do they give back to the clubs who produce, you know, who provide them with the players? to play at those World Cups, to get back very little. You know, the, FIFA's a money-making machine. So I think there is going to be more pressure on governing bodies to spread the wealth around, actually. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I yeah, I don't think, though, a lot of people are saying this is going to be a sea change and that we're going to see more fan power and the 50 plus one model come to Ger no. uh, England. I don't see that happening. I don't. I, I, don't I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. There's no chance that's going to happen. I mean, you don't become a billionaire by being shaken easily, I suspect, or making uh, easy decisions. Uh, Neil Francis is, is predominantly talking about rugby here, but uh, it's interesting, his take on the last week. He says the only winners last week were the owners. He said they did have to apologise to their fans, but apologies come cheap. And he says that the boys were jockeying for position and leverage. In a PR stunt like this, they've managed to wield enormous power, exert their influence and spread fear in one fell swoop. It's a masterstroke. And he thinks going forward now, that whenever there's a negative response to what they're requesting, all they'll have to do is say Super League. Uh, how meekly did the whole thing fold? Do the good guys really think that a few hundred supporters chanting outside Premier League grounds had any effect? What notice did the owners take of all those people who got involved or Boris? Um, yeah, I wonder. See, I sort of think their own staff ambushed them in a big way. I also don't think the English clubs were that committed. Like Spurs and Arsenal just thrilled to be asked and going along with the crowd. They don't have any real leverage. Uh, Sheikh Mansour and Roman Abramovich did not really need this. The status quo suits them fine. I think they were very lukewarm and suddenly you're just left with Manchester United and Liverpool driving this thing and I don't. I think Henry is genuinely uh, more under the thumb too strong a way of putting it of, of Liverpool fans than we might be realising here. I mean there is kind of special fan base and I think that just leaves the Glazers as those who don't give a damn. So I, I really think this has backfired. I don't think this was a masterstroke at all. But anyway, look, he could well be right, Neil Francis, down the line. But what's really interesting, he talks about rugby. So he, there's, it's, it's, it, this had all passed me by that all this stuff is going on. Uh, Darren Childs has left his post as CEO of Premiership Rugby. Uh, Neil Francis says that wouldn't have garnered any headlines. He's just a faceless bureaucrat who in 19 months in charge has done, well, not very much is what Neil says. Uh, what's pertinent now, though, is where he's going. Childs has taken up a consulting post with CVC, who have bought 14% of the Six Nations. Ordinarily, this is not of huge importance. But there are so many gamekeepers turning into poachers, it's hard to keep track. Mark McCafferty went from Premiership to CVC. Ian Ritchie went from RFU to Premiership. And Childs has now gone to CVC. He says, I can't help uh, but thinking there's more than this is just a great fit for all parties. It happens in business all the time where key executive... Glazers for eight years. At one stage, he was challenged by supporters at, at an airport in Budapest. And he told them go and watch Chelsea, and he often defended the Glazers. You know, after they put up prices or you know, mm. uh, ticket prices, etc. So a lot of people now are saying, you know, these are the kind of people to get out of football. They shouldn't be there, but they were happy to work with them for a long time. Well, the other point is, Gronje, the Glazers out posters. Imagine it happens. United are going to cost four billion. Mm what well-intentioned soul is going to take over Manchester United for four billion? Well, you see, this is it. Um, and it goes back to my point. I mean, you might not like these owners, but, you know, look at the grief Ole was under last, was it November, when things weren't going well and everybody wanted him out and there's not enough money to be invested. Um, so, you know, it's, 
it's hard to get it's hard to get um people that are going to take over and spend an awful lot of money um and we've all outlined the the, the groups that do that and they're from the middle east and uh, coming from areas that have lots of money maybe don't have the same interest in football they just enjoy doing it and they have lots of money to spend but when they come over as well, they're spending so much money. It's like no other club can actually keep up with that. And just, I'm going back to Graeme Sooney's point, yeah. but I just think it's, it's pertinent here as well. But just as we were talking about there, like he was saying like about people being involved, that business people as well, and that they have acumen for business, but maybe their their fatal flaw is actually being involved in, in a club. And it's just talking about his old chairman, David Murray Rangers, who spent tens of millions of his money chasing the dream there. And then Mike Ashley runs Newcastle United, as he would any of his other businesses. And look at how unpopular he is there. So it's just, uh, I mean, is, this, is it bad that you have, you know, I don't know, Joe. I mean, if he goes, who comes in in this place? Like what, you know, what, I know people are, they're very unlike, likeable league. They're the only group that came out and actually gave a reason why they wanted to stay involved in, in the European Super League. But, I mean, who who else is going to go? What, what funding, what money is going to come in from someone else that's going to pay, pay that and actually add to that and spend more money? I'm, well, not, I'm not sure. Well, at the moment, it's Petro State involved in sports washing or a venture capitalist who will perform leverage buyout and milk the club for what it's worth. They're your two options at the moment, I would think. OTB. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. 